Welcome to the second edition of the E4M Health Communication Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Padma Bhatia and today's conference is going to be yet followed by E4M Health Marcom Awards. Well, this conference brings together the most influential and knowledgeable stalwarts of the health and wellness sector on one platform. The theme of the conference this year is marketing, communications, and brand empathy in the time of a pandemic. Well, I'd request everyone to tweet with our hashtag, hashtag E4MHCC as one word. Well, today, Exchange for Media is thrilled to have an esteemed panel of speakers who will share their thoughts on different topics. Joining the sessions are our three keynote speakers. First up, Shivam Puri, CEO, Sipla Health, Sabrina Prince, EVP, Group Management Director, FCB Health Global, and Amir Jalil, the group CEO of uh, and Mulan Lo Lintas, who's joining us in addition to a long list of CMOs and health experts. Well, the agenda includes an opening keynote on the marketing, communications, and brand empathy in the time of a pandemic, followed by a panel discussion on marketing health in India's new consumer-driven world, which leads us to an interesting keynote speech on marketing continuity, digital trends for strengthening brand engagement in a remote world. We also have a panel discussion on strategies to ensure and support mental health, and we will end with a, our valedictory address. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time before we move on towards our awards to commence the conference for which we're really excited to have Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, Exchange for Media and uh, Business World to make the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Afternoon. Welcome today on a very auspicious event. We're celebrating the fraternity that needs to be celebrated most, the healthcare fraternity. I know 1st July is the doctor's day. So, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we did uh, try and have uh, Dr. Anurag Batra out there uh, for his uh, welcome address. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anurag Batra, for joining us. Uh, on the same, and I'd request everyone to keep using the hashtag, hashtag E4M uh, HCC as one word. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is always a pleasure to hear uh, him speak and let's begin with the day with a thought provoking speech on marketing communications and brand empathy in the time of a pandemic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us reconsider what is important to us and rethink the relationships we have with people, organization, and brands. More importantly, it has made us question where we place our trust. Social distancing has made us realize the importance of relationships, family, and human connections. It has also made us realize what is important and what makes us human. It has also raised many concerns and uncertainty with such complexity, how can marketers create a meaningful connection and relevant content in the times of crisis? Well, the answer truly lies in the key human ability, the ability to connect through empathy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you our first speaker of the day, Mr. Shivam Puri, CEO Sipla Health, who will address the topic. Well, Shivam, uh, Puri brings the edge and discipline of 17 years of sales and marketing experience in the diverse Indian FMCG sector to the world of healthcare. An alumnus of IIT BHU and IIM Lucknow, he has had successful stints across leading companies like Jubilant Foodworks Limited, HUL, and ITC Limited. Under his able leadership as the Chief Executive Officer, Sipla Health Limited looks to rapidly scale up and transform healthcare in India by pushing the boundaries to consistently innovate and offer world-class wellness products to make a difference to the lives of consumers every day. While in his spare time, Shivam runs marathons and plays the drums. And as a doting dad, he loves spending time with his two boys. Thank you so much, Mr. Puri, for joining us today live uh, at our wonderful event. It's an honor to have you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bhavna. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Can someone uh, put up the presentation, please? Sure, Mr. Puri, we'll get that done. Could we have Mr. Puri's presentation? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Bhavna, as you know, as I was beginning to talk, uh, as I was logging in, I realized that we had a similar event almost a year back, 
uh, and it's so surreal on how things have changed in a short span of 12 to 15 months. Uh, because the topics that we have picked up at that point in time are very different than what we are talking about here. Uh, but yeah, for because of paucity of time, let me straight away jump into the topic. Uh, marketing and brand empathy in the time of pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, you know, uh, what I've done is, uh, and I have some 15, 20 minutes to talk about this. So what I've done is I've put together a few common themes around the consumers that we see today. Uh, one big disclaimer, uh, these are basis the experience of last 12 to 15 months. And as we have seen, these experiences change uh, and can actually undergo quite a significant shift, uh, even in period of a few quarters, forget years. Um, you know, and, and the shift we've all seen, wave one began with shock and awe. That was a time when we actually had our last uh, marketing, uh, you know, a similar uh, program by E4M around healthcare. Uh, uh, there was a shock and awe around what was happening around us as wave one descended on us. Uh, and as the cases started coming down, there was almost a euphoria. Uh, almost a feeling of saying probably India has beaten COVID and probably we are different, uh, which is when wave two quietly crept in. Uh, and then there was massive misery and despair. All of us have experienced it personally to our near and dear ones and to our extended families as well. Uh, and, and today, as we sit on wave two receding, there are talks of a possible wave three, wave four, and possibly a wave in. Uh, no one actually knows. Maybe there's no more wave uh, coming our way. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, you know, post today, uh, you know, a lot in terms of how consumers uh, behave uh, and, and think through the brand communication will change basis the external environment. Uh, but as things stand today, there's a lot of fatigue and despair. Uh, all of us personally feel that um, there is a trust deficit, right? Many of many consumers I've spoken to actually are not sure if, uh, you know, if, uh, if they actually should go and get vaccinated, uh, something so basic and so critical. Uh, to to you know take care of uh, the COVID challenge, uh, but uh, what that uh, you know translates into a larger trust deficit uh, that the consumers are seeing today. There is of course postponement and down trading as any down wave, uh, you know any challenging wave uh, has shown in the past. But interestingly, there is also uh, you know some there are some elements of revenge buying which we saw during the unlock of wave one, uh, and uh, actually you continue to see revenge buying among the you know upper middle class and uh, high net worth individuals even today uh, there is indulgence yes there is indulgence uh, much little uh, you know a very different aspect of indulgence than what we used to see pre pandemic uh, when there was a lot of flaunting around indulgence today the 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 indulgence that we see is more about emotional gratification it's more about you know life is short uh, it's more about saying, you know, I don't know what uh, what to expect tomorrow. So let me live uh, the day to the fullest. So these are some of the emotions that the consumers are seeing, uh, you know, have seen in the last 12 to 15 months. Uh, and this is what we can expect to see if the same scenario continues in future as well. Next slide, please. Next, what I've done is, you know, I have translated this into the communication themes that many brands have adopted. Uh, and to make it a little interesting, what I would also do is I'll play a few commercials where I feel that you know, many of these themes actually have been leveraged to the fullest by the brands. Um, healing empathy is of course a big, big theme. Uh, all of us can relate to it. You know, when you're broken and when you're down, nothing works as well as you know, a healing tonality uh, and empathetic uh, outlook of a brand. Uh, second, there is a big feeling of loss of control. So a brand trying to help you regain control uh, over your life, again, is a big theme uh, that's uh, working really well today. The feeling of gratitude, right? The feeling of little mercies of life and the feeling of the fact that, you know, I, I and of course, we we had experienced these feelings of gratitude even before pandemic and lots of marketers had started to talk about it. But I think the importance of this has grown exponentially. And we'll see a few examples of this uh, in the coming slides. Nimble and adaptive, again, is a big, big, uh, you know, characteristic of a successful brand in times like these. Uh, things are changing very, very fast, very quickly. So a brand which is actually very, very adaptive to how their consumers are feeling around them. Because the moment you are out of uh, tune with what your consumers are feeling, not only do you risk alienating lots of consumers, but you actually risk alienating your core franchise as well. So a brand needs to be super nimble and super adaptive. And we'll see uh, some examples of that uh, in the coming slides. And last but not the least, making a real difference. 
uh, you know, uh, this again was uh, always true, even pre-pandemic, but again, the importance has gone up many fold in times like these. Consumers see through who is making a real difference and who is just faking it. And hence, it's very important for brands uh, to be very sure and only when they feel that they have really made a difference to their consumers, should they go out and talk about it. Yeah, so these are some of the, uh, you know, themes, quick themes that I could pull out, uh, you know, that I wanted to share uh, uh, with all of you. Next slide, please. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll talk about a few examples of where we have seen these uh, come alive. You know, a great example is eBay, uh, which launched this accelerator program for small businesses the moment uh, pandemic struck. Uh, and of course, small businesses, you know, uh, were struggling to uh, connect with their consumers and customers. And here came eBay, a free offer for all the small businesses for three months, a free sign-in, lots of help, lots of help around free marketing and support. Uh, a fantastic example of helping consumers regain control and consumers here, for example, for them would be their customers, the e-com customer base. Uh, they helped them regain control of their businesses of their life and made a real difference. Uh, and look at the fantastic adaptability of the business. This They actually went live with this program very early into the game, uh, which is when lots of other corporates were thinking about, you know, what to do in a time like this. Next slide, please. So from eBay, this is the other example. Uh, you know, if, if an employer were a brand and an if employee, uh, you know, were a customer, three great examples uh, or three very different examples that I could pull out. The one of Twitter in news very recently for announcing permanent work from home. The one of Apple trying to get some of their employees back in office and some bit of backlash beginning to, uh, you know, they've beginning to, they've begun to face. And the example of Tata Steel or rather the whole Tata group absolutely fantastic uh, you know uh, dictum the communication that they put out to all their uh, employees and even externally where they actually said that you know if an employee loses his life uh, during this pandemic and they will actually uh, build salary or on uh, provide salary to their near and dear ones uh, till the employee would have attained the age of 60 and some real differentiated benefits um, you know in terms of housing and medical uh, for the families now you know look at look at this so many employees do many policies and they become of course very popular externally but in a time of pandemic these minor things get heightened uh, and an employee and even a regular you know employee looking at these corporates forms a perfect image of what these corporates stand for in a time like this so this is again a great example of empathy and making a real difference uh, people see through the real difference being made to their lives and the lens to which these corporates have gone to take their uh, to take care of their employees. Next slide, please. So that was on employee branding. Uh, next, I've just put out an example of Verizon, and there are many other corporates who have done similar stuff. You know, they have just opened their hearts and their uh, you know their resources to their customers, core customers. And this is an example of free resources for kids of all ages, free digital access, no questions asked. Uh, and you know we have a long list of uh, companies which have done this in India as well. I can assure you that a uh, customer of these corporates who has used and leveraged these resources will always have a special place in their heart for these corporates. No amount of branding, no amount of communication can cover up for uh, the real difference that they make through these actions. Uh, you know, an absolutely fantastic thing to do in a time like this. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, you know. Uh, Okay, so this is an example of uh, World Hand Washing Day. Uh, you know, I've spent uh, bulk of my life in Unilever. Uh, and I remember, you know, how critical it used to be for us to figure out a way to make a uh, change in terms of hand washing habit for consumers. And the discussion used to be around cutting edge creatives, some clutter breaking communication, something quirky, something cool, just to try and convince a consumer to change their habit. The tonality uh, has completely changed and the brand is different. This is Savlon this time. The tonality around Global Hand Washing Day completely changed. Many of us would have seen this video which went viral. Uh, I'll request you to play this video for all of us. But, you know, a brilliant example of empathy uh, to actually make a change, a habit change, unlike pre-pandemic times. हाय मैं स्वप्ना बचपन से मुझे पेंटिंग करना बहुत अच्छा लगता था मेरी पेंटिंग्स को देखकर लोग मेरी हमेशा तारीफ करते हैं बोलते हैं मेरा टैलेंट और मैं बहुत स्पेशल हैं
शायद आप में से कई लोगों से मैं बेटा पेंटर हूँ पर उसके अलावा मैं बिल्कुल आप जैसी हूँ मेरी सुबह भी शुरू होती है अलार्म क्लॉक के चिल्लाने से आप जैसे ही मैं भी उठ के वापिस थोड़ी देर सो जाती हूँ चाय के बिना मेरा दिन भी शुरू नहीं होता दोस्तों से बातें करती हूँ मुझे भी तैयार होने में थोड़ा वक्त लगता है ऑनलाइन रहने की आदत आजकल मुझे भी लग गई है और उन्नी अपम को आपके जैसे मैं भी कभी ना नहीं कह सकती हाँ पर एक बात है जो शायद आप में से बहुत लोग नहीं करते पर मैं हमेशा करती हूँ मैं हैंड वॉश इस्तेमाल करना नहीं भूलती 20 सेकेंड हैंड वॉश करने से यू स्टे प्रोटेक्टेड फ्रॉम जर्म्स एंड डिजीजेस कोरोना वायरस जैसे वायरस से भी और मेरे लिए हैंड वॉश इस्तेमाल करना इतना इजी है तो फिर आप क्यों नहीं करते हैंड वॉश तो व्हाट अ फैंटास्टिक वे टू बिल्ड अ हैबिट और चेंज अ हैबिट यूजिंग एम्पथी एज एन इमोशन thank you um uh, you know the next one is life boy uh, again you know i picked this campaign up for um uh, not only the real difference that these campaigns this string of campaigns have made but uh, also because of sheer adaptability of the campaigns you know lock one uh, unlock one lock two unlock two they actually were running different creatives and commercials completely staying in sync with the mood of the nation uh, and because of which the the you know the acceptance of the communication was amazing second thing to note the brand has gone to the background it's more about public health messaging uh, and communication and which makes the brand so endearing uh, to consumers can you play this commercial please har indian se ek vinti hai corona virus ab tak gaya nahi par achhi aadatein chali gayi un aadaton ko wapas laaye mask pehniye naak par bhi vaccine lijiye do gaj ki doori rakhiye और लाइफ बॉय या किसी भी साबुन से हाथ धोएं या अल्कोहल बेस्ड हैंड सैनिटाइजर का इस्तेमाल करें कोरोना वायरस से इंडिया की सुरक्षा अब आपके हाथ में है या एंड एंड यू नो फॉर दोज ऑफ यू आर इंटरेस्टेड यू शुड पुल आउट द अर्लियर थ्री फोर कमर्शियल्स दैट लाइफ बॉय केम अप विद एंड दिस इज अनलॉक वेव टू कमर्शियल इट डजंट लुक लाइक अ कमर्शियल इट्स अ परफेक्ट पब्लिक हेल्थ मैसेज Uh, and any consumer watching it understands that this brand is trying to make a real difference to my life yes they are trying to sell their products towards the end uh, but they are trying to make a real difference to me yeah so i picked this up uh, uh, as a part of that next next one please yeah so next uh, you know i have uh, two commercials of kia and uh, burger king uh, very interesting because you know there are brands uh, and this is an example of a brand which has a funky cool quirky tonality of course all of us know kia used to talk about being the badass in town uh, now for a brand which has such a funky communication that they have been uh, working on they suddenly can't become an endearing brand which has lot of empathy right because consumers will see through it and they will of course find it inauthentic so this is a brilliant example of a naughty brand like kia and what they have done uh, to stay in sync with the mood of their consumers externally can you play the uh, video please I'm sexy Mr. Brown, a prince who's just been crowned. I can brighten up your day, 'cause I'm so sunny. Hey, I'm sexy Mr. Brown, heading out to town. You can hate me all the way. Yeah, so this is called being nimble and being adaptive. Kia could have said, "Oh, what can I do? My communication would not work in a scenario like this. So let me just stay quiet." They said, "Let me continue to keep my brand salient." but do it in a manner uh, which adheres to the mood of my consumers yeah uh, the next one is uh, an, another brilliant one from burger king uh, again a funky cool quirky brand uh, known for its out of box commercial i'm sure many of us would have seen the commercials and we understand the tonality this is you know an amazing take on what they did to their tonality to again bring it in sync uh, to the mood of their consumers can we play this one please your country needs you to stay on your couch and order in do your part and we'll do ours order through the burger king app and the delivery fees are on us 
So staying home doesn't just make us all safer, it makes you a couch patriot. And to help healthcare heroes, we are donating Whopper sandwiches to nurses. And we are also proudly supporting the American Nurses Foundation. Stay home of the Whopper. You know, so this commercial not only talks to their core consumer base, it talks to a much wider uh, base around. Uh, and the respect for the brand goes up multiple notches as they continue to talk about their brand. Uh, so a brilliant uh, communication. Next one, please. Uh, okay, yeah, so next one is again, you know, a very interesting example. You would seldom see a brand uh, asking consumers to not use them and request them to not use their brand uh, and become endearing to their consumers in the process. And the example here is of Uber. Uh, of course, you know, the, you know, as the lockdown happened across the world, uh, the brand just completely went out of business. Uh, and, you know, they could have fretted and uh, thought about what to do in this context. They said, let's, let's, put out a public message, leveraging our brand, requesting consumers to stay at home and not use an Uber. Just imagine when time becomes, you know, when we come back to normal times, uh, uh, which hopefully we should, uh, we already are moving in that direction. Uh, a brand like this uh, continues to stay salient uh, throughout uh, a time when their services are not being used by any consumer. So can we play the commercial, please? This is Uber. You know, a great example of empathy, uh, of making a real difference to consumers, of being in sync with the times. Um, so, you know, that's it from my side. The idea of sharing these um, live examples with all of you was to hopefully trigger some thoughts. Uh, and I know not all these examples were from healthcare uh, brands. Uh, you know, I, I took the liberty of going outside of healthcare. Uh, but these have uh, equal relevance uh, even when we talk about communicating healthcare. So I hope these have triggered, these examples have triggered a few thoughts uh, in your minds in terms of how you could communicate in the times of pandemic. Uh, you know, I wish all of you uh, a very healthy uh, life uh, and I hope all of you stay safe and your near and dear ones stay safe. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Puri, for joining us and uh, kickstarting our wonderful uh, event today. We really absolutely value all your insights you've shared today. Thank you, Mr. Puri. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, what a brilliant start that was. Now it is time uh, to have a message from Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, Exchange for Media and BW Business World to join us on the stage and screen. Over to you, Dr. Batra. Batra. Good afternoon. Welcome today on a very auspicious event. We're celebrating the fraternity that needs to be celebrated most, the healthcare fraternity, I know 1st July is the doctor's day, but uh, doctors are the frontline workers who have saved countless lives and continue to put in so much work. But uh, the whole healthcare ecosystem over the last 17 months, and especially the last three months, has been super active in their response to COVID and pandemic. At Exchange for Media, early last year, we launched the Exchange for Media Healthcare Marketing summit and the awards to look at the nuances of marketing of healthcare, pharma, uh, well-being, uh, the healthcare, well-being, pharma uh, domain holistically. So today we are meeting for the second edition of the healthcare marketing summit and the healthcare um, marketing awards 
I just want to say that healthcare uh, in India needs to become the biggest priority. Uh, I believe that we spend the least amount of money on healthcare in India as per the statistics available. As a percentage of GDP, we spend less than one and a half percent on healthcare. Most countries spend between five to six percent on healthcare. Uh, this is the time to up the spends on healthcare, uh, and the uh, money should go into uh, building capacity in terms of trained professionals in the healthcare domain. It should go in putting up plants for pharma. It should go in terms of building communities that can support each other in taking better healthcare decisions. Uh, so really, the time to up the spends on healthcare has come now, uh, and you know the healthcare marketing summit and awards is a initiative to support the professionals, the communicators that are able to uh, take the message, uh, which helps consumers in this regulated domain. So I wish uh, all the winners who have won in the healthcare awards, the second edition, all the best. Uh, we got overwhelming response. 150 entries, second year, and uh, we've got response from major organization, almost every player in this segment. So we are grateful uh, for your participation. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we start the healthcare marketing conference. You listen from the leaders in the domain in terms of what the trends are in terms of healthcare marketing. So I wish you luck. I look forward to learning something new. I look forward to celebrating your success. And as I said, Healthcare has to become the most important focus. For all of us individuals, healthcare and immunity has already become important. But as a nation, we need to spend more, celebrate our healthcare workers more, and uh, everyone in the healthcare ecosystem who does a fabulous job of supporting each other and making sure the system works. So congratulations and welcome to the second edition of the Healthcare Marketing Summit and Awards. God bless you, stay safe, stay vaccinated, and I'm sure you'll continue to do well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Batra. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we had a slight uh, technical issue, so we couldn't get the video on, but uh, Dr. Batra is such a personality that when he talks, you'd love to hear him. So thank you so much, Dr. Batra, for those thoughts. Uh, they will encourage everybody today who's viewing us and also who's going to be talking uh, in some time. So thank you once again, uh, Dr. Batra, for that. So ladies and gentlemen, as he rightly said, there's a great day uh, planned ahead. And we just had uh, Shivam Puri, CEO of Sipla Health, who shared his bright ideas on the topic. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to move on to our next topic, which is marketing health in India's new consumer-driven world. Firstly, we hope you are having a great time today at our wonderful event. Uh, it is time now to talk about the topic marketing health in India's new consumer driven world. The growing econ economic prosperity largely spends on the health sector by the central and the state governments. Availability of digital technologies and data bolstered by the wave of coming on uh, age millennials taking a self actualized approach to healthcare are all influencing a dynamic shift in the way brands need to approach their audiences no longer is simply guiding a buyer through the sales funnel and intermittently managing the relationship acceptable. Consumers now have to have the control, the awareness and the tools to influence their own decisions more than ever before. In today's marketing landscape, it is indeed essential for brands to provide their consumers with memorable experiences that inform, delight and foster an emotional connection, especially within an industry as emotionally driven as healthcare. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you our esteemed speakers on this panel. First up, Ms. Smita Murarka, CMO of Euroflex. Thank you so much, Smita, for joining us today. Thank you, Barna. We do have Ms. Suman Varma, CMO of uh, Hamdard, who's joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Varma, for joining us today. We also Hi, thank you. Pleasure having you here, ma'am. We also have uh, Ms. Darshana Shah, Senior VP Marketing, Aditya Billa Health Insurance. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Hi, thank you, Varna. Hi, everybody. Pleasure having you, ma'am. We also have Ms. Uh, Nikki Gupta, co-founder of Teamwork Communications Group. Thank you so much, Ms. Gupta, for joining us today. Thanks, Bhavna. Thank you. Nice to be here. Pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, introducing you to the session chair, uh, Ms. Uh, Tasmai Laha Roy, editor, E4M. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Ms. Roy. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you for the introductions. Pleasure. So, ladies and gentlemen, with such uh, eminent uh, personalities on your stage and screen, it is now time to give in the live baton to Ms. Roy to take it forth with her eminent panel. Over to you. Welcome speakers. Uh, so nice to have uh, such an esteemed panel uh, together uh, at our meet today. So, you know, we uh, try to utilize the most of the time and give you speakers the maximum time to speak. So, you know, quickly coming to the first question, uh, which we uh, thought of understanding from you guys is, you know, the last year, if there is one thing that people have started taking seriously and people have started uh, to take uh, care of, and that's health. Right. So that has been the uh, central point of everything in the last one year. So, you know, in a circumstance like that, when people are already talking about health, when there is already so much awareness around health, does that make uh, marketing easier for you guys? Or, you know, does that increase the focus on marketing and does that make you re-strategize, make it more robust? And, you know, how does that change the dynamics of the whole uh, situation since my uh, health was the uh, main uh, primary focus area? Uh, last year. So we can start with you, uh, Smita. Great. Uh, thanks, Tasmay, and thanks, um, Exchange for Media, for doing this and giving this whole focus to health. Uh, coming to your question, um, brands like ours, which are actually catering to consumers through products. So we are in the business of uh, sleep solutions, and our main product currently is mattresses. Right. I think uh, COVID aside, and the negativity of COVID aside, this was really the awareness that we were waiting for for decades. Absolutely. Right, because uh, we propagate a lot about the importance of sleep and health. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, in this country, this was really ignored. I mean, uh, this was thought to be as something we just uh, try to do and catch up four or five hours. And mm -hmm. uh, we should be proud if we have not slept properly. That was really uh, the culture that we are brought up on. Yeah. So it, it was really difficult for us to talk a lot about sleep and we genuinely believe in sleep uh, talking right. about versus just selling so for us of course when business was uh, really active pre-covid uh, it was also a choice of weightages to give on pure product uh, communication right. versus talking about sleep which is anyway not you know heard by consumers so for us honestly this has become easier because uh, consumers are now in understanding that what are the few things which are very critical to health and this year, a lot of editorial media has also talked about sleep and the importance of it. Uh, so the facts have really put things in uh, favor of brands like ours, which were not so much uh, healthcare brands, but um, you know, cater to some element of uh, health. So for us, um, it, it's it's been great because um, I think as a nation, we've started taking our health more seriously overall, and I hope this continues post COVID too. And we don't go back to uh, you know abusing our uh, mental and uh, physical well-being uh, so i think a lot of good things also we should take out of this uh, wave that uh, we've experienced and uh, hope a lot of behaviors uh, really stay so for us i think it's been uh, quite good right right uh, over to uh, you suman what do you think at hamdard you know has has your marketing strategies changed drastically over the year or in the last one year and a half or has it been the same What's changed for you in uh, terms of marketing in the last year and a half? I think uh, the last one and a half years has been such a brilliant roller coaster ride for everybody. I think right. it's changed us all. It's changed companies. It has changed the way you look at sales, marketing, right. supply chain, whatever, every department of it. And I think uh, just like the last uh, lockdown took us all by surprise. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it just meant a lot of re-strategizing in the sense that we tried to do things that we'd never done before. And as you know, Hamdard is a very traditional 100-year-old company. It's followed very uh, strict, normal ATL kind of things. Mm -hmm. So this was a time that it really required that you wear a new hat and uh, get onto it. So, of course, this whole digital uh, penetration that sort of boomed on us. Uh, mm -hmm. was a great way to look at reworking and reframing and repositioning all our brands. I think that's what we did. And uh, while, uh, you know, the sentiment was, the outside sentiment was not such that you could come with song and dance and do a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hype around that, yet we wanted our brand presence to happen. And uh, 
we dared to do things which were different, which I dare say that had the pandemic not happened, we would never have done things like that for our brand. Mm -hmm. So yes, we did come up with a lot of uh, digital campaigns to keep our brand presence alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we looked at uh, doing a bit of inside mining because while everybody is locked in, who's the one who's most pressured? It's Absolutely. the mother, right? So there were communications uh, that centered around her and we positioned our products and brands around that. So we did some music video. We had a Sunidhi Chauhan singing a song for us, but you know, it was very well received because it, at the heart of it, the brand proposition of health and wellness never went out of focus. Right. So we right. did things like that. Uh, I, I think very early in the times of our, uh, of the lockdown last year, uh, it just, it sort of, you know, we were just sort of thinking, what is it that one needs to do? And who is it that who's not scared of this pandemic? That's right. And, you know, as a by the by, the conversation happened, what about the bodybuilders? And what about really the rough and tough people? Are they scared of this? And one thing led to another. And that's when we signed up with, you know, Babita Fogart and uh, her sister. And we did a communication with Zez Medder Koku basically driving home a point that it is wiser to be a darpo and stay home rather than go out and mm -hmm. you know lose it all but we sort of played up with our own uh, products which was mm -hmm. our immunity builders because as you know hamdard is well known for its uh, mm -hmm. immunity and respiratory products and who would have thought you know that here was an opportunity to get a captive audience and talk about our range of products and I think we were well received at that stage as well. So uh, yes, while the whole world was talking about digital and digital transformation, and I call it the digital revolution that was happening, I right. think Hamdard must have been one of the last uh, companies to have got onto the digital uh, bandwagon. And that's right. what we did last year. We got onto e-commerce, online health consultancies. We did our uh, salience uh, brand presence through digital. and. You know, it did give us a lot of great results. And uh, the best thing that happened was that it was a great discovery to know that, you know, the, the normal pattern of uh, discovery, engaging mm -hmm. and buying pattern has changed. And that's a right. great thing to know because uh, the young people have shown it to us. The millennials perhaps have really shown us that you have to keep it fluid. There are moments, there are micro moments, and all of this could be utilized in a different way. So yes, I think overall, uh, we did think different. I personally, because I've been associated with Hamdard uh, from the agency perspective for 15 years, and then now I'm sitting on this side of the table, I can tell you there are a lot of things that I now do. I wouldn't have dared to even come and propose it to the people right. because you know you would think you know, somebody's just lost it to be uh, proposing mm -hmm. an idea like that. So yeah, Absolutely. we're managing to do good things out here. Great, so, great. Right. Yeah. So that, that's so many interesting insights, you know, doing something for the first time uh, in the last yeah. uh, year. So uh, we've come to you, uh, Darshana. If you can uh, tell us a little bit, uh, walk us through uh, what changed for you guys, because insurance was something, you know, e people who haven't heard of it, people who haven't ever, you know, uh, gone online and searched what kind of insurance they need, what is the kind of insurance that suits their budgets, their requirements, you know, every one of them must have checked out one plan or the other in the last year and a uh, half, if I may say so. So, you know, how has that changed marketing for you guys? I'm sure there was pressure on product, on new customer acquisition, there must have been so much going on. So tell us a little bit about uh, what changed in your marketing strategies in the last uh, year and a half? Yeah, so that's, that's my yes, thanks. It was a clearly unprecedented life for everybody. Yes. And um, the good thing, I think, for once, I really felt excited to be a marketer in a health insurance category because right. for once, the customers were waking up that I have, do I have a health yes. insurance? I used to always say that, you know, health insurance, nobody is going to wake up and say, Kare, yaar, mere paas, aaj I want to go and buy clothes. I want to buy many things. Health insurance is not... Even talk of the mind, so for once this category suddenly became a full category and not a push category. Yes. So, and uh, yes, everything changed for us the way even Suman was saying and uh, others were saying. So, in last year, March, when pandemic really hit, is a uh, Jan 5 March is very, very big for us in insurance as sales. And this is exactly the time March is the largest month in the year. 
and suddenly we had to completely go on a halt absolutely so it was uh, and uh, insurance is sold a lot through intermediaries so so imagine you can't meet customers face to face is stop is stop everything so it was completely uh, devastating at that time that the, you know enter india everything came to a halt and more than that there was a lot of anxiety with uh, customers there was a lot of panic so the good thing what has helped us is that we had launched this company with a positioning of health first we were not about health insurance we were about health first and focus on your health so that entire proposition that we have built in the last 4 years is what really helped us because this was a time when people were not looking at sales they were not looking at any brands coming and pushing them on buying products but really empathizing and helping that and that's when we started this entire so we have a, i have a huge community online called active living and my entire health from home series is what we started we partnered with lot of influencers uh, big names like new kuti you know aditi govitrekar nikki mehta and many such things a lot of doctors and every day we used to have facebook live series from morning to night on physical fitness nutritional wellness we also had uh, around uh, the doctors coming and talking mental wellness so all those wellness whether it is physical nutritional mental and also doctors coming and talking with the uh, pregnant women senior citizens so this entire thing we ran for six complete months a lot of engagement from health from home we also created an entire uh, you know conversation around the new health partners because people were used to having their health buddies when you go out for a run walk mm-hmm. you know somebody nudging you and that's what india is all about the whole community way and you know with your health buddies and suddenly that had stopped so we created an entire series called sehat ki nayi aadat right in under health from home where you had to look at your mother in law or your husband or you know the mother and child how can you create new health buddies in the house at your home and do things together and still not give up this gave us a lot of uh, you know this gave us a lot of customers coming engaging with us from the health lens not just a health right. insurance so that really helped our positioning mm-hmm. that helped my uh, you know entire intermediate my bank because we sell a lot through banks we sell a lot through you know the agents and entire abg group being a large conglomerate yes. so, so many of abg companies and also we could create this kind of a platform conversation and engagement through i think we reached almost 70 million customers in this entire uh, you know time we in that 6 months of lockdown we have a part of the facebook hall of fame so a lot of new ways of doing things lot of agile uh, i also have a mobile app for all these activities so you could do suddenly we had to introduce all virtual home videos to live active because we also give money back if you are staying active so that's our proposition so creating everything literally up you know differently looking it from the consumer lens being more empathizing with the customers was the way we went around doing this and it really helped because we were finally as a brand still growing at 70% year on year Absolutely. so that's the kind of uh, yes and wow. health has been the focus no doubt right 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 so uh, you know uh, uh, nikki over to you you know uh, while all the other speakers spoke about their brands and you know what they have been uh, doing in the last year and half i'm sure for you you know you have worked with multiple brands together uh, so multiple clients uh, tell us what was that one common thing you know that they were looking to change in their marketing strategies in the uh last year and half what are the kind of solutions that they were asking you for to you know bring about that whole change in conversation bring back the whole focus of the marketing to help uh acclimatizing people about the importance of uh, their products services etc tell us a little bit about how it has been in the last year and half uh certainly um tamshi so um i tell you uh, as you said that health is a universal crisis right now and everybody is facing yeah. the same situations being that in mind we are a health focused communication firm and we work for more than 45 clients in healthcare wow so when we are talking about healthcare communication and um, you know 45 cl- client having clients in our kitty i would say that it has been a very roller coaster ride for us sure. every client wants a very custom made tailor made communication plan and the plan is no more like even the monthly plans are not even working in the healthcare scenario right now because things are changing so frequently that you cannot rely on the long term plans here so either our teams are working you know around the clock mm-hmm. and they are making short term plans like for 15 days for 7 days according to the client's requirement 
if I talk about in this last one and a half year, we have done multiple healthcare award-winning campaigns. We, we have done uh, for Hero Cycle, Cycle Revolution, we have talked about where we did not just talk about cycling, but yes, it is the whole, you know, health related campaign. It was not just the focus on cycling, but yes, it was related to the health. We are working for Apollo Telehealth. So how the telehealth is because of this pandemic, people are not going for physical, uh, you know, consultation. That's Everybody right. is opting for online consultation. So we That's created, uh, you know, more than uh, 7 lakhs um, online consultation in a specific period. Mm -hmm. And we really did great campaigning. And then with influencer marketing with Novartis, we did, you know, disease awareness campaign. So it was a holistic approach for all the brands that we are taking and be it an oxygen crisis. So the team is very agile. We need to, the industry is whole agile. So we really need to work accordingly and create the customized plan for all the brands. Right, right, great. Uh, so, you know, another interesting thing that comes up from each, what each one of you said, like uh, Suman mentioned a couple of things that were digital first uh, initiatives that were taken last year. Darshana mentioned so many uh, interesting things that happened online last year. So, you know, there is uh, one uh, common thing that happened across board for all marketers, irrespective of their sectors, uh, that, you know, um, Content became a very important part of marketing, right? Even brands that were never present online came online to, you know, kind of carry on a certain piece of communication, which was done through interesting content, which was either to grab the attention of the people because a lot of people were going online, either on their smartphones, TVs, other devices. So content became a very huge and important part of the communications that brands sent out. So, uh, Suman, we'll uh, start with you again. If you can, uh, you mentioned a couple of things in your first answer, but if you can elaborate a little bit about, you know, the um, importance that you gave uh, to content as a marketer and how it changed things for you. Um, you know, my biggest uh, issue in hand has been that all our brands are 70 plus years old. And, uh, you know, a lot of people would turn around and say, oh my God, but it's so traditional. Now, it doesn't help to be so traditional when you're in a health and wellness brand. You have to look at the efficacy of the product rather than just the imagery around it. But yes, of course, uh, uh, you know, you have to be talking the youth language. You have to be uh, talking to people who influence decision making. And uh, we all know it that when you have a 14 plus at home, they sort of start influencing you to think different, look different, behave different. Now, uh, it definitely meant one thing that uh, we weren't going to just stick to traditional media because traditional media till September last year, I don't even think most brands were present on television as such. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we were enjoying the little fame that we had got from the digital world, we decided that we would uh, dial down the age of the brand by mm -hmm. uh, taking on what really sort of resonates with the consumers today and our consumers being that 18 to 21 that we wanted to talk. And right. if I specifically look at a brand like Safi, which is all about anti-acne, mm -hmm. and that's the age that you really want to be talking to. Absolutely. So it definitely made sense that you get onto content as well, because uh, when we made our digital films, they're very different. They're very unlike uh, who are, I got acne. None of those stories are there. There's no brand window that you talk about uh, blood purification. So we really took on to a little higher level and we brought in, uh, you know, let's say mini celebrities in the right. sense that people who are super achievers from different right. walks of life. And right. we use them as, uh, you know, the core uh, narrative uh, people. Right, uh, right. Then we went on to Brute platform. So, you know, Brute, as we all know, has its own engaging way of talking. So Absolutely. we came up with three of our films on Safi uh, as a content. And I think it really, really sort of was so well received. And what is interesting, I think what's amazing is that today radio comes up with content. Today you have digital platforms of other publications who give you great content. And of course, uh, 
you know, you can't be so far removed if you don't get onto today's uh, bandwagon and have influencer marketing. So we looked at all of that, whether they were in Instagram, whether it was in uh, LBD platform, which launches new products and stuff. So I really think that even if I may say so, for me, um, it was a great learning experience as, uh, you know, as a marketing person trying to look at how much more new things that I can come up with, which is going to engage with the clients, uh, I mean, with the consumers in a way which is, you know, the content has to be sticky for the brand to stay in your mind, right? So it had to be relevant. It had to be uh, completely in sync. And I wanted it to be talked about. So there was an element of virality that sort of came with it. So yeah, I think uh, it did great things for us. So content now is definitely something that we specifically focus on building as we go uh, into the you know, out of the second wave, preempting the third wave, and then trying to strategize and say, what more? Right, right. absolutely. Uh, yeah, Smita, so. I would uh, want to understand the same thing from you as well. You know, any content around sleep sounds like an amazing idea to me. But I'm sure uh, as a brand, uh, you must have also had uh, a content plan because everybody's talking about content these days. So what is it that you uh, did around that? If at all you did something uh, around content in this time so we did a lot around content and wow. that yes. was uh, really pivotal for us that was the differentiating factor uh, mm-hmm. among everybody else uh, in this category and up yours as mm-hmm. um, so before covid as i was telling you uh, yeah. as we were very passionate about sleep which mm-hmm. is on the product offering that we're giving uh, unlike um, you know maybe Hamdad which the product itself is very directly held then yes this of course was more about first educating on sleep yes. and then the products and of mattresses and what right. we so uh, we we make um, uh, premium mattresses we make um, doctor recommended mattresses mm. In, in a country where mattress itself most of the purchase is unbranded right so you can imagine mm. It was a very, very indirect conversation pre-COVID. But once uh, COVID struck, we were ready. We were ready with a lot of content because um, as a team, we had been reading books. We were passionate about sleep. So we were ready with that. And uh, last year, the first wave it hit and there was complete lockdown. As a management, as, as teams, we didn't think twice. But we went all out and uh, we released a campaign on sleep for immunity. Uh, so it was there on TV. It was there on digital. We also got uh, very active on uh, social media and digital. Uh, We did things, um, you know, which uh, no other brand in our category has done before. Uh, You know, so we used a lot of influencers to talk about fitness, health, how you should build a sleep routine, um, you know. So And and, uh, last year, uh, during the first wave, there was a lot of stickiness on influencers and live videos because people were generally upbeat, even though there was a lockdown. And uh, they were ready to embrace new things, right? If you all remember, there was a lot of cooking that all of us did. And uh, similarly, fitness. um, So a lot of people were quite upbeat and uh, it worked really brilliantly for us. We, uh, once business became normal, we did not look back and we said content on sleep has to still stay. Uh, We really need to balance it out along with business content, which is around product, selling, offers. Plus, we need to continue on sleep. So sleep was always an equal kind of a conversation on our social media platforms. Um, So even uh, just before the second wave, uh, we had one of the largest uh, properties, IP properties, Sounds of Sleep, which I don't know if you all have heard, but it became quite viral organically. It was the first time in the country that any brand like ours has done a property on music. And it was about the regional lullabies, uh, really reviving them for the young parents, um, reducing their anxiety. And some of the top singers came together and it was hosted on Sony uh, YouTube channel as well as ours. So this was wow. completely different. It was not in the realm of business, but of course on the whole education of sleep. Uh, when the second wave struck this time, the mood was much more somber, right? If you all recall mm-hmm. about two months back in April, it was really a negative scenario where yes. uh, any, yes. any brand which was seen to be promoting business or a product was really negative and uh, we didn't want to be doing that so what we've been conscious about in our content strategy is 
know the mood of the consumer right there, right then. So it's not about creating a plan on Excel sheet uh, while we do all that, but making sure that as a team, we are very clued in on the moment of the mood. And uh, we made sure that that time we just took a back seat. We took off all our uh, product communication. And for 15 days, we got doctors on board, in fact, this time. Wow. So this time it was not so much about, uh, you know, talking about positivity because the word positive, I think, uh, had a negative meaning altogether. Yeah. So we shifted our strategy to more uh, really get the experts, the qualified experts, uh, which was doctors, and uh, make them say how... Um, Firstly, uh, sleep impacts uh, even uh, vaccine efficacy. So we had this um, whole, um, you know, article written by our MD and some of the doctors and the big names, uh, how sleep impacts vaccine efficacy pre and post. And that was a very relevant article when all the entire vaccination uh, drive was uh, starting off, right? So very, very uh, relevant conversations and bringing in the right experts at the right time, uh, relying on the mood of the consumer and uh, balancing between uh, business right. kind of content, product kind of content, and actually what you stand for in a much larger objective. That has really been our strategy. Uh, we've also, because we've been so focused on what else can we launch to help people sleep better, we've been able to um, you know, expand our product offering. And today we sell a lot of uh, pillows, accessories, mattress protector. In fact, last year we uh, launched an antiviral mattress protector something which normally might not have uh, taken so much of a center stage. But uh, holistically, I think uh, we were able to really uh, look from a consumer and healthcare uh, point of view. We're also doing a lot of research on uh, sleep internally, and we would be coming out with a lot more things. Um, so I think if you know what uh, really uh, part of health uh, is, is it that you're focusing on as a business, and you're very single-minded about that from consumer point of view, more than your that's business right. point of view. I think that that makes great content because, um, you know, I mean, otherwise you're just selling. As Suman said, if if there's Safi as a product, it's still relevant today. Uh, similarly, sleep is going to be relevant forever, right? So yes, absolutely. You're not talking to a particular kind of an audience or trying to sell them something to suit, you know, just an age group or a lifestyle. It is that's essential. Right. Uh, so for healthcare uh, content, I would think uh, really be true and honest to what you're all about. Uh, if 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 you're totally out of the realm of healthcare marketing, then uh, just because the mood is around it, probably doesn't make much sense to talk about it. But luckily for all of us on this panel, it is something that uh, we are strongly focused on. So content comes naturally. Absolutely. You know, it's so interesting, Smita, after having heard you about so much content that you did around sleep. I, I now feel that I deserve so much more sleep. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure that's the kind of message we're trying to drive home through the content, you know, that it's effective. And the consumer realized that, you know, this is the kind of product they need, or this is something that they've been missing out on. So I'll ask you, Darshana, you've already mentioned the interesting things about working with influencers, etc. you know. Uh, uh, tell us that, you know, uh, Healthcare is something like all our other speakers are also mentioning that we don't know what kind of, if it's a clothes that you're selling, if it's something, you know, jazzy that you're selling, you know that there's a certain kind of content that you're expecting from these products. But healthcare is something we are not sure that, you know, what, what is the kind of content that we would see, you know, that would have a stickiness factor to it, that people would come back to it. And also, you know, content around healthcare can also go viral, like we have seen. Uh, heard our other speakers talk about so tell us a little bit uh, you know that how did you manage to keep these uh, content different yet uh, making sense for your product and your brand value and also reaching out to the right uh, set of audience yeah so see for us first thing let me talk about the category this category has always been uh, called as mediclaim and not health yeah. insurance that's yes. how people still think and that's actually nothing but the psu product so yeah. that was when we launched only by itself, that was a change. We wanted to bring that. We wanted to focus on health insurance and that also on health and health insurance. Right. So which is where we had always started our journey. It's just that last year, this year and a half, it's really amplified. So when you talk about, like I said, I already had started with a community and it was very small, like two, two, two and a half years back. I only had 64, 65,000 customers coming in and in the community, which we call active living, physical fitness, nutritional fitness, mental fitness, and uh, lifestyle conditions. Because these are the nuggets of if you have diabetes, if you, and India is a world diabetes capital. 
through diabetes, if you have uh, asthma, hypertension, you know, blood pressure. So this is all that we also cover in our product. If you and if you're staying healthy, like I said, we give you 100% of your premium back in the wallet, and you can actually so you can literally make the product free. So with this kind of a promise that we are in the journey, health and driving engagement, because again, health insurance is a buy and forget category. You don't want to buy the product and obviously use it because you don't want to get hospitalized. Yes. So you are going to keep it in your locker and don't. So, so everything changed last year. Last year, suddenly a lot of COVID cases. People had a lot of anxiety. So this community where we had a lot of conversations around health and the content, to be honest, earlier, we were focusing more on static posts and you know writing a blog kind of long form articles. Last year, suddenly we realized a lot of content need a lot of empathy with the consumer on the on, on and brand becoming a brand who's reaching out and you know understanding your need so we bought all variety of content medium so whether it was podcast whether it was uh, music whether it was videos and obviously static and infographics so literally on the platform we created 200 plus content you know pieces literally writing it all new so having so many content partners on the background and that is what created. So last year I had uh, you know a million plus visitors on this. This is not my health insurance. This is just a community sort of a you know a space microsite. So that's the kind of traffic we got today. We have around twenty thousand plus subscribers who are month on month coming, repeatedly using it. So that is what the drive driving content for that. Second thing is interest groups. So today um, because I have you know like we have twelve million million lives covered. So we have an entire application mobile app that you download again i said it's a health and wellness ecosystem we partnered with a uh, lot of all these telemedicines doctor on call all that which is on the medical side also on the health side we have fitbit garmin we have google fit apple health so we can track the health we can we can help you on any diagnosis or anything like that so know your health improve your health and get rewarded is a platform that comes to life through our app mobile application and there also i have interest groups i saw 300 percent so we have running group we have nutrition group we are also adding a diabetes group so i have seen 300 percent jump in conversation people joining the groups and actively participating so suddenly just going out and selling a health insurance product the way this category does we've actually turned this entirely on its head and started from the health first conversation and that is why content has become a you know large piece for me the way we do things differently and i'll give you some of the examples like every year on world health day i do this property and this was my fourth year called jump for health that you jump for your health and we donate prosthetic leg to somebody who can walk this has almost become a moment i have global jumping groups across the globe people have created groups for us and they keep donating it to us and this year alone and this was completely driven digitally we also go through our bank partners and all so this year alone i have donated 1100 you know prosthetic leg so that's a kind of digital virality that it created and similarly, we do on Cancer Day and just just Yoga Day. I think two weeks back we had World Yoga Day. So this time we did Yoga Day differently. We created Yoga Music also. Uh, we've done a lot of partnership with music. Music was another thing during so creating a you know health music, a health playlist. So we partnered with Spotify, we did with Ghana. So creating this kind of different kind of content, which which is on the move, on the go, mm -hmm. the bite size, you know, uh, snackable content as you call it. So these are the things that we did uh, last year, and that's what has engaged a lot of our consumers. That has got the, you know, the brand uh, scores going up. So yeah, I think that's what we've done, and of course, a lot of awards that won. So great, great. Uh, uh, Nikki, I come to you, and you know, uh, help us understand. I'm sure you have seen a variety of content, right? You have so many clients in your basket, so I'm sure each one of them have a different kind of uh, content depending on what they are selling. Right. So tell us about the variety that you have seen, you know, from X kind of content to Z kind of content. You know, what is the kind of variety that you've seen? OK, so I would like to start with this, um, you know, uh, the importance of content in healthcare. So you know, just a small thing when it comes to the healthcare, healthcare is communication is a very serious business. It's not like a lifestyle yes. because it is related to your life and death. So, yes. of course, the whole, um, you know, uh, the focus goes on the quality of the content, the importance, the how trustworthy is your content, 
right how informative is your content so these are the things that we really need to work our, around when we are working on the content you cannot create any content like any launches simple the yeah. real difference you can make in during your com- communication so it's important to be very authentic it is important to be show empathy during your con- mm-hmm. uh, you know conversations and the con- uh, communication so when it comes to the content we have seen the variety as i mentioned about be it you know the first when the first lockdown started nobody was aware about the what we are going to do to be very frank the brands were not aware everybody yeah. was just moving what media was talking about yeah that time uh, we are we realized and we just start working on the as we have more than 17 18 hospitals in our organizations so right. we started giving information and talking about more on the current news the hard news which media is looking right. for mm-hmm. either it's uh, it's on the immunity everybody wanted to boost their yes. immunity that time yes. so yes, yes the immunity was the key that time at the same time hospital beds and how many number of patients are increasing and uh, you know how do you want to stay fit because during the first wave everything was normal means there yes. was not such kind of casualty where the people were not happy around and they just don't want to do very serious story so it was more over a informative uh, stories that we were doing that time and we were focusing more on the hospital aspects gene strings we work for which does uh, you know um, covid testings so be it a testing labs startups and multiple uh, you know when it comes to the second wave it was more over a very serious content and it was a ongoing thing because hospitals in between and the healthcare brands along with the covid they wanted to promote their other things as well so during our communication we need to ensure that we are focusing on the other areas as well be it cancer beat other diseases also right so we, we were focusing and taking the holistic approach and uh, you know publicizing and communicating with the media in a very mindful manner with the very trustworthy content and you can see the mushrooming of the healthcare brands when it comes to the immunity booster because everybody was running after immunity yes so, so be it social media content a pr content or the influencer marketing content one thing that we anchored it with the trust empathy and uh, right information because when right. you are giving a piece of wrong information you know it spreads like a fire a wildfire so keeping that in mind the being a uh, you know communication firm it was our responsibility to keep the focus uh, apt on the brands along with the right communication i would say absolutely absolutely you know there are so so many important uh, points that you uh, brought out nikki like important uh, importance of the communication and the right messaging that is also important you have to be sensitive about what you're talking about what is the communication that you're giving out so you know uh, given we have very little time left on this panel i would come to each one of you to understand uh, the importance of you know being sensitive uh, in your content yet being different from your competition when you are giving out a certain piece of uh, information or communication to your uh, customers and you know how differently have you done it for your brand you know what makes you cut through the clutter so we'll start with you again some uh, someone if you could wrap it up for us okay uh well i'll just speak about hamdard first because yes. that helps me to yes. talk about uh, what we could have done yes. i think uh, the desire of any marketing uh, person would be to create a content that would be clutter breaking or create any communication that's clutter breaking but you know the business that uh, we handle which is uh, health and wellness mm. the most clutter breaking thing out there is the product itself Absolutely. what is the product that's going to be uh, driving it or what are the services that as a health company that we are going to provide to people that's really going to uh, you know sort of uh, connect with the consumer that was of prime importance and i think even in the pandemic last year we launched 11 products and that itself wow. was a uh, quite a task because you know as uh, i think nikki spoke about that uh, everybody spoke about community and stuff like that but the point is that 
uh, when you are, uh, you know, I think this pandemic gave uh, supported nature and natural products and it gave them a chance to sort of thrive and survive on. And uh, it is therefore, it was a very natural thing that uh, despite having 450 products in our own kitty, right. we came up with a lot of other products which were the need of the hour, you know, whether it was the single ingredient products, which uh, you don't need to be prescriptive in that, you know, you could just sort of buy it off the shelf. And since we were already present in e-commerce and places like that, it was so easy to purchase these products. So the communication that went with it were, I wouldn't say insightful, but they were beautiful because, you know, when you start seeing the kind of ingredients that have gone into the making of that product, it sort of starts talking to you. Right. So that's how uh, beautiful our communications looked, you know, in the hmm. digital space. So uh, we did a lot of other things. And also during the pandemic, I think that Ayush ministry supported and promoted a lot of uh, yes. natural products. So I think this gave boost to a lot of uh, products who are in the Yunani space and otherwise. And Yunani as a system is known to few and those who believe in it, believe in it wholeheartedly. Yes. But uh, I think what also this uh, whole thing, you know, the pandemic did to us was that it allowed us to outbox the brands and start indulging and having a conversation with people who are not the users of this product. So right. uh, a lot of social listening really helped us to understand that what is it that people wanted to understand. So, you know, I think in the past, if the communication or whatever information dissemination had happened, it seemed a bit layered. It helped us to sort of demystify it and put out a very simple communication where putting the heart of the product as a, as a story and uh, right. doing a lot of things. So I used... We are very extensively because, you know, during the pro uh, pandemic, uh, four of our products went in for uh, research. They wanted to understand whether it works to treat the, you know, the COVID patients and we are awaiting results now. So that also was a talking point. So I think all in all, uh, what it did, I, uh, what I think the pandemic has really helped us to understand and there's a great learning for it is that you know, one needs to simplify, demystify uh, the products, talk about the natural products in a more natural manner and help it to connect with not just a section of people who understand the, the method of uh, this holistic treatment, but sort of start disseminating that information to one and all. And, uh, you know, the surprising bit has been that the number of letters and queries that we get on a daily basis on products related to respiratory, skin, immunity, in, uh, I think has been quite awe-inspiring. And uh, this has also given us a lot of opportunity to create our online cons health consultancy, uh, you know, which is sort of, we started last June, but I think it's sort of taken off and we really need to have more doctors to be able to service them than to be able to service our clinics. So that I think has also been uh, quite alarming. And uh, I think like, um, I think Smitha was talking about that since most of my products are related to health and wellness, it sort of gives us that one advantage to reach out to people during this time, however trapped you may feel inside your homes, that here are these natural products it's going to have a better effect on your lifestyle rather than, you know, popping a lot of other uh, kind of medicines which can have side effects because these have no side effects. So, yeah, I think that's a great learning in all of this. Right, right. Uh, Smita, I'll quickly come over to, you know, uh, picking up exactly from there, you did not have a product which is directly related to health. But again, it has a deep relevance in the whole system. So, uh, in terms of your messaging, in terms of your marketing, what is it, uh, you know, that differentiated, you know, um, a communication to convince buyers alongside being sensitive at the same time, given the time that we are, uh, we were all in. So, you know, it, tell us about your key learnings and how you will do things differently from now on, or if things are changing for good for you, because we have all entered into a very weird phase and things are constantly changing. So yes, uh, your wrapping up message, uh, Smitha. 
Yeah, I'd like to touch upon some fundamentals of yes. marketing and why uh, even more, I'm sure a lot of people have realized, businesses have realized it's a very yes. function still, uh, budget or no budget, uh, is that uh, content is, um, content and uh, the crux of it is what you do as a business, what you believe yes. in, what products you make, right? So you, in, and especially in the age of social media, which, uh, you know, is, is very real, you can, you can really uh, separate the fake from, from right. the real story, you cannot faff anymore, unlike probably just a headline ad or, you know, just any other medium. So social media has made it more important that what you say has meaning and is consistent. Yes. So before uh, we can even have content marketing or really put out facts or figures over there, we should have done our homework. Um, as I said, we already had a doctor recommended product range, uh, yes. so mattresses, uh, one of our leading uh, mattress range, Duropedic, uh, was recommended uh, and certified by doctors. And this is something we did two, three years before when, um, you know, we didn't know something like this is going to come in mainstream and it's going to become so important. But it, it happened because we genuinely as a team believed that things products like this needs to come. We have a very strong innovation and research uh, team, even in the product division. So it cannot happen overnight that COVID strikes and tomorrow you, you reorganize your uh, business to really focus on healthcare and products that impact it, right? You have to really uh, breathe it from all functions. So product wise, we were already trying to make the most of uh, the knowledge that we had and upgrade it and um, you know, have ranges which are more meaningful uh, for consumers. On the other side, uh, as I said earlier, we had already equipped ourselves. Uh, we were very passionate and it flows from the top. So we were very fa passionate about sleep and all of us, uh, you know, uh, wantingly wanted to learn more about sleep. So internally we had learning sessions. We had a lot of things which pre COVID and during COVID it got strengthened, which help us all come out with nuances and facts about uh, sleep. Um, which finally gave us our content strategy, right? So some of these things, especially healthcare, especially serious topics uh, like this, you cannot just have a creative idea or uh, you can you know, just do some great content marketing, which is very viral and, and move on to something else. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be honest. It needs to be human. It needs to connect with the, the other person who's listening to it. So it's, it's a lot more nuanced. It's a lot more factual based. Of course, you layer that with your creativity, you layer that with your, um, you know, new uh, way of projecting it. So sleep can be projected in multiple, multiple ways. That's what you bring to the table as a marketing team. But other than that, your whole business, your company, your product portfolio, all need to talk the same language and, and really be differentiated from the rest of the pack. Uh, for us, luckily, we were in a category which, were, which was literally sleeping on uh, content. And uh, we were able to really, um, you know, get a lot more bang for our buck because of that. So from an ROI perspective or from a reach perspective, it, it, it uh, gave us a lot more versus established categories um, where everybody's talking the same. Uh, but of course, now we are getting into a situation where uh, everybody's caught up to it. So it'll help us be on our toes even more. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, combined with a, a category that was not so actively talking about uh, the topic that we, we should have, uh, which is sleep collectively so much, uh, it really gave us a strong edge. But um, the, the really the uh, bullseye need for good content is your business and your product portfolio being around it consistently. So that's really the starting point. Right. Thank you so much, speakers. It was such an interesting session to hear all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Please enjoy the more interactive panel discussion that was this world. All uh, talking on our topic, marketing health in India's new consumer-driven world. What an excellent uh, discussion that was. Thank you once again to all our speakers. While we move on to our next session, I'd just like to re-remind our uh, audience on tweeting with our hashtag, hashtag E4M, HCC as one word. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to move on to the next keynote for today, which is on marketing continuity, digital trends for strengthening brand engagement in a remote world, by Sabrina Prince, EVP, Group Management Director, FCB Health Global. Well, with, fifth, uh, with 20 plus years in healthcare marketing, including research, public health relations and advertising, Sabrina is a strategist who's able to identify pivotal customer insights and impact customer behavior to drive revenue. As the EVP at FCB Health 
Europe, uh, Sabrina is an empathetic leader and a mentor and champions diversity and inclusion. Her passion is helping small business owners recognize their brand essence and cultivate marketing strategies to expand customer loyalty. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for joining us today and being a part of our wonderful summit today. It's an honor having you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely fine. So with this, Sabrina, I hand it over to you. Thank you for joining. Perfect. Thank you so much. And if you can share the presentation. Sure, I'll get the team to do that. Could we have Could a presentation? Yes, right there, over to you. Awesome. So uh, amazing speakers that we've had thus far uh, talking a lot about brand engagement and their strategies and empathy. Uh, my presentation may be a, a bit more, more educational and applied in focus. Um, obviously, as you know, the theme is digital trends for strengthening brand engagement in a remote world. But really what I wanna focus in uh, on specifically is the importance of custo customer platform, uh, customer, next slide, Customer, customer data platforms. Next slide, please. Could we have it's not a moving forward for me? Yeah, yeah, just a second, Sabrina. No worries. Over to you. There we go. Cool. All right. So again, focusing on the importance of customer data platforms. So to frame our conversation, next slide. I'd like to uh, take us a year back to the beginning of the pandemic, which I know may not be a place we all want to go to, but this was um, an interesting uh, survey by Statistica on the online behavior of consumers in the US around that March, 2020 timeframe. Um, and the website of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, cdc.gov, was the most popular governmental web domain in the US in March, 2020, with almost 432 million digital visits. The majority of the American population considers the CDC the most trustworthy source of information on COVID-19. CDC.gov recorded over 934 million page views in that month alone. In stark contrast, social media was considered the least trustworthy source of information on the coronavirus outbreak, according to the same March survey. So, what does this tell us? I mean, the unfortunate truth is that we live in a world of information overload and of mistrust of politicians, sometimes scientists, and on occasion, each other. And this reality has forced internet users um, to cut out the middleman and really turn directly to the source. And this places a big responsibility on healthcare marketers to be a resource for unbiased information providing that unbiased information in a way that is um, authentic to the consumer, as you've heard from the previous speakers, relies heavily on security and the integrity of the data that the marketing team is able to, to consume and collect. Next slide. Obviously, we know that delivering the best customer experience is a core goal for most companies, um, and in order to do so, we need to understand and collect data about our customers and how they interact with our promotional materials. Our clients, you, uh, marketers, may be using a variety of digital platforms to capture these customer interactions like Google Analytics for websites or Adobe Analytics for any sort of customer campaigns you may have or for specific HCP to rep interactions we may be collecting that in Salesforce. All of this makes complete sense, but what this does and what this data, um, uh, what, what this results in is that the data is collected in silos of information. And these silos limit the, the cohesive understanding of the customer. Next slide. That's where the concept of connected data comes in. Next slide. So in order to own the data and to ensure that we can deliver data informed and solution driver, driven user experiences, it's really important for marketers to be able to manage and activate or act on that data in real time. And this is where a customer data platform or CDP helps to improve this engagement and those conversations. So what do I mean when I'm referring to a CDP? 
Essentially, a CDP is a single dashboard where all data, all tagged data, all identifiable tagged data, so information about your customer that you can get down to an identifiable level on, is captured across all the brand's digital properties, and it can be managed and segmented and inform any customer insights. So this is a, an example of just a mocked up CDP customer data platform. And you can kind of consider this, this diagram instead of a, a, a line, more of a loop. But on the left, you'll see the, the inputs, those digital platforms that are collecting data from websites, any customer relationship programs, any you know, HCP rep uh, engagements that are happening and feeding in the data into the centralized CDP platform. The beauty of a customer data platform is that we can collect that online data information, but also any offline information that is occurring from events when we get back to live events, or any sort of segmentation or market research or surveys that currently exist that create more of a comprehensive picture of the customer. And what this does, or what a CDP does, is, is bring together all of that information from the disparate sources in a format that is um, easily digestible, actionable by the marketing team so that they can collect it, it's standardized, they can learn about what the customer is doing, why the customer is doing it, and determine the best way to act on that, push that information back out for any um, lead generation or whatever the overall brand strategies are. Next slide. So why is this so important? You know, why should you care? Obviously, today's customers are assuming that your company knows them, that they remember them, that you know who they are, you know what they've done, you know what they want. Basically, that you can read their mind. They're having this sort of experience that feels authentic and almost like prescient by brands that aren't healthcare brands. They want to be loved. Um, they expect the marketing company to serve relevant content based on their experiences, based on data. Um, and marketers and marketing technologists know that gathering this data, acting on it in a unified way isn't easy. And we also know that internally, only a few companies have done this successfully. The rest of them, probably you, your clients, are battling with technology, strategies, budgets, organizations, staff skills, and a host of other obstacles to success. But customers don't really care about any of these issues. If you don't give them what they want, next slide, it's game over. They'll assume that you don't care about them, you don't understand them, and they'll take their business to somebody else, to the competitor who they believe will treat them better. And it doesn't matter whether the competition or the other firms actually do treat them better or not. The fact is, once you've lost them, you'll have to fight twice as hard to get them back. And it's therefore not a surprise that delivering this unified, love-inducing, brand-inducing, brand-loyal customer experience is one of the highest priorities for marketers. I'm probably preaching to the choir, I know. Next slide. So you're like, okay, yes, Sabrina, I agree. I want my customers to love me. Where do I begin? Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, a unified customer experience is impossible without unified customer data. Most data, as I mentioned before, originates in separate systems that weren't designed to share it with anything else. Traditional methods for collecting data into unified customer profiles like enterprise data warehouse have failed to solve this problem. Newer approaches like data lakes have collected the data into like a big lake, but they fail to organize it effectively in a way that marketers can act on it. Um, a CDP is an alternative approach that has had great success at, at pioneering companies, and it puts marketers in direct control of the data unification. Um, it helps them to ensure that it's focused directly on their marketing goals, marketing requirements, 
and CDP specifically um, apply specialized technologies and pre-built processes that are tailored to, to meet marketing data needs, to customize the information in a way that's actionable for marketing. Um, and this essentially allows them for faster, more efficient solutions um, than any general purpose technologies. We know how important it is in this evolving landscape to be able to understand what our customers are doing and react on the dime. And CDPs assist in that process. Next slide. So I've listed here just five CDPs that as, a, as an agency we've worked with, with clients. I don't expect you to read these all, um, Segment, Exponia, List Tract, Amarsis, Telium. They'll be in, in the, the wrap up and the handout, but these are um, CDP solutions that we found to be um, successful in really combining the data analytics, um, the platform in a way that is digestible with this unified view that allows marketers to really be able to understand and bring together their wealth of information online and offline to action in a real time manner um, for their, their customers. So again, take a, a look at these um, at your leisure if this is an area that you're interested in exploring. Next slide. So, okay, you've hopefully figured out that you wanna try using a customer data platform. Um, you've got your technology together. Now you're ready to create this unified customer experience. So, you know, diagram on the, the left is really just showing you a, a, a mock-up of what that would be. But on the right, I've listed four typical process questions that you would like to tackle as you're undertaking this effort. Um, First, develop and align on your data strategy. Do you know who you're targeting? What do you need to know if you don't know that? Is there additional research that's needed? What's the behavior that you're trying to change in this customer along the customer journey, whether it's acquisition or trial or loyalty? Do you want them to tweet? What is that? Try to pen that down. And then determine your content strategy. Uh, speakers before were talking about their, the amazing way that they've been using their content to motivate patients uh, over, over the, the pandemic. Figuring out what your messages are, knowing your content strategy is imperative to be able to, to turn that information out to the customer based on uh, their actions. I'm gonna give you an example of how you can determine that content strategy soon to come. Um, now, assuming you've got your content strategy, it's really important to be able to be responsive. And the best way to do that is to leverage template-driven creative. So not recreating the wheel every time you need to communicate to your customer, whether it's on banners or posters, online or offline, but having that in a templated manner so that you can pick customer A, behavior B, message C, and organize it, get it out the door and extremely important to constantly integrate analytics at every touch point, because unless you know the results of those efforts, we don't know how to improve, maximize, or change um, our strategies. Next slide. So this is just an example of, of being able to implement this that we've done for, for a brand, one of our clients, and their focus was really on leveraging uh, data relevance to drive trial for these HCPs. And you see, of course, how they've used websites as the really foundational resource for information and uh, you know, pushing the physician to prescribe that sort of the action that is desired in that medium um, for more long form messages, more in-depth information about dosing or anything that's related to safety. Usually that's delivered in any sort of email or direct mail campaign, um, but also how that could work on digital displays, whether it's virtual or live con congress congresses or conferences. Um, next slide. Then you can see, of course, how you could expand this to all of your customer groups. So this is just an example of a, a ecosystem, multi-channel ecosystem, where we've uh, created that, that world of cus customer experience for the physician, a similar complementary world for the patient 
based on uh, the, the experiences and drivers that we know they're going to interact with. And knowing what our content will be for the physician, what the content will be for the patient, the marketer has the opportunity to create like a, a, a universe where when that conversation happens, they're both speaking the same language um, and it is the most productive leading to the treatment of that particular disease or prescription of their medication. Next slide. So uh, you've got your, your assets, you've got your CDP, and um, you know your customers, you know how to reach them. What do you say? We talked about content strategy. And this is just an example just a, of, of a content workshop that we hold for clients often that really is focused on ensuring that all the messages across all your tactics um, within a specific tactic are working to achieve the, the goals that are aligned to your brand strategy. So a way this could work is that you could bring again together um, an assortment of uh, participants, whether they're medical people, uh, marketing people, consumers, um, people who know your message, your messaging, prioritize the audiences, um, your customer audiences based on the impact that you think you can make with our messages and really group those messages um, based on the ones that we feel can, can drive or move our customer towards the desired outcome. And what you end up with is like a matrix that kind of outlines the barriers that exist with your customer and the specific messages that would be needed to change uh, that behavior. So again, would love to talk through how this could work with you in the future, but doing something like a content workshop or a card sorting workshop is actually what we call this, where you get all your messages onto cards, prioritize, identify the customer is really a great way of aligning on your content strategy. Uh, so that you can be nimble um, with your messaging across all of the various platforms or channels that are part of your, your marketing uh, mix. Next slide. I talked about templated communications. Um, developing templated communications really allows you to cadence those messages that you prioritized when you did your content card sorting uh, workshop. Um, so you can cadence them by segment. And this is what really allows you to create that experience for the customer that feels dynamic. Um, I'm on a website and I'm, I'm reading certain information and then I move to another channel and I'm getting a similar information. It seems like the brand is following me. They understand me. They, they know my pivot points. All of this can be actioned in a way that feels uh, intuitive to the customer when you, you can template out um, these, these communication uh, uh, vehicles. In this example, it's for a banner. Next slide. So I threw a lot at you real fast, um, but really um, focusing on customer data platforms and bringing the power into the hands of the marketing team, aggregating that information and that data that is in-house, offline, and online, putting it in a singular dashboard place so that you can understand and contextualize it and drive better decision-making for your customers. So as uh, so, I was uh, near the tail end of the presentation and essentially um, I, I know that I've thrown a lot at you as it relates to customer data platforms and um, the, the strategies needed to integrate them, but but all those things aside, as you wanna consider this or whether you, you're currently using CDPs, um, here are some questions to consider on how you can further create this, this uh, unified um, intuitive customer experience. One, what would a personalized experience feel like for your customer? So certainly we know as marketers, it's really important for us to put ourselves in the, the seat of our customer. Um, and we know that they want to be loved. So in what ways can we, can we demonstrate that? What would that feel like from the brand? Um, what do I need to know about them or need to know to create this experience? So perhaps a little bit more market research might be needed for you to be able to answer that question. Um, do I have the right data, either like insights or channel or behavioral data to deliver on this? What technology do I have in place today 
and what do I need? So we can always start with where we are today and then build to. So just to close, a few questions to consider as you're delivering your uh, unified customer experience. What would a personalized experience feel like for your customer? What do you need to know about them in order to create this experience? Do you have the right data? Do you need additional uh, market research to be able to inform this decision? What technology do you have in place today? And what do you need? You know, start where you are today and build towards a more robust uh, offering. How can you start small? What is the one additional thing you can do to create that personalized experience? I think if you ask yourselves those questions in a rigorous manner, you'll be able to move toward creating that loved uh, sort of comprehensive customer experience that we know our customers crave, even though you're in healthcare. So that's my presentation. Thank you for being good students. Now I have some examples of some creative work just to ramp up your energy level again. Next slide. Next. It's a video. So this is for Accord, the biggest pharma company you've never heard of. Enjoy the video that's coming up next. This is a case study from Accord. You know, Accord, the biggest supplier of medicines to the NHS. Surely you've heard of us. We make a fifth of all generics used in the UK. Come on, we make 4.3 billion pills a year. We're in one in three homes. You've probably, definitely taken one of our pills. You must have seen our name. It's on factories up and down the country. And on thousands of lorries. It's on lab coats. Name badges? <sighs> we get this a lot. So we've made a new campaign. Introducing the biggest generics company no one's heard of. And we made some bright orange ads. And we gave them some wiggly headlines. Telling it like it is. That it doesn't matter if no one knows who we are. It won't stop us doing amazing things for the nation's health. And we made a lot of them too. So there's no way you'll forget our name. <sighs> it's Accord. Thank you, Bhavna. And we have one more for Bear Healthcare. This was uh, Bear Healthcare as uh, a client of ours and um, have many uh, contraceptive uh, devices for women. And this was their celebration, 60th anniversary uh, celebration of the contraceptive pill. And if you go to the next one, that's also the video. Thank you all. Next slide. Learn about a revolutionary approach to family planning, including not only spacing of children, but also new hope for the childless through a remarkable new pill. Since the pill's launch, we've seen it transform women's lives around the world. So Bayer wanted to create a campaign to celebrate not only 60 years of the pill, but what the pill means for women today. The pill. You know, the pill. Just two unremarkable words. But 60 years ago, it changed the world in a remarkable way. Supporting women to have children by choice, not chance. It helped us pursue our own ambitions and take on the world. It empowered us to reach for new heights. Support the children we have and strive for lives free from hardship. To shape our own futures and to shape others. And to live our lives our way. 60 years ago, a world of opportunity started with the pill. Since then, Bayer has been bringing women benefits in contraception and beyond and continued to innovate, decade after decade. All that started with just one little pill. Celebrating 60 years of empowering women. Bayer, 
your partner in women's health. The campaign rolled out across social media, digital and print materials. 60 years of independence, opportunity and freedom. All that started from just one little pill. Thank you, Bhavna. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sabrina, for joining us and uh, being a part of this incredible summit. We really value all your insight. Thank you once again. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. So I just request the team, uh, thank you once again, Sabrina, for joining us. And uh, with this, uh, we're going to be moving on to our next topic. So ladies and gentlemen, that was an interesting presentation. And thank you once again, Sabrina Prince, on that. Now we move on to another important conversation that people are having worldwide. Corporates now understand the importance of it much more, which is strategies to ensure and support mental health. Well, this session is about to connect with consumers during the time of uncertainty and heightened anxiety. Participants discuss how brands must change the way they market and sell to consumers to remain connected with their target audiences and progress their business goals while remaining mindful of consumers' mental wealth, wellness. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we move on to this wonderful panel discussion, I just request you to keep tweeting with our hashtag, hashtag E4MHCC as one word. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to introduce you to the eminent panelists on this panel. First up, Dr. Bhavna Gautam, founder of Embrace Life. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhavna, for joining us today. Great having you. My pleasure. Thank you, Bhavna. I see that we share our names. So <laughs> it's lovely being here. Pleasure. Pleasure having you, ma'am. Also, we have uh, Ms. Piali Das Gupta, Senior VP Marketing Columbia Pacific Communities joining us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Piali Das Gupta, for joining us today. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you for having me. Pleasure being here. Also, we do have Dr. Vispi Jokhi, the uh, CEO of uh, Messina Hospital. Thank you so much, Dr. Jokhi, for joining us today live. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here. I hope I'm audible and everything is fine technically. Yes, yes, perfect, sir. Great Thank to you. have you. We also have uh, Ms. Samantha, counseling psychologist at Fortis Hospitals. Thank you so much, Ms. Samantha, for joining us today live at our summit. I, I believe she's just logged in. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Samantha. If you can hear us, do acknowledge the same. All right, so we'll just give her some time on setting that up quickly. Uh, we also have Mr. Nitti Zamurdia, co-founder and director at Indira IVF. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today live. Uh, thank you, Bhavna. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be you know, talking on this particular very important topic in the current times. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to introduce you to the session chair of this a wonderful panel discussion. That's Ms. Nazia Al Alvi Rahman, E4M editor. Thank you so much, uh, Nazia, for joining us today live and being a part of this wonderful panel discussion. Thank you, Bhavna. I'm audible. Yes, perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, with such eminent people on your stage and screen, it is now time for me to pass on the live bait into Nazia to take it forth with her panel. Over to you. Uh, hello, all. Uh... My apologies, we had too many technical glitches and we're starting late, uh, but I, I, I will try to cover up and I'll keep my questions short. I'll keep my intro short so that I give more time to uh, experts like you to speak on the topic. Uh, I think uh, mental health, I believe, has been the most discussed uh, disease globally after COVID in the last one year. Uh, everyone, I mean, uh, this mandatory uh, confinement in which you know uh, we all uh, are currently uh, in has given uh, has uh, there's been a sudden surge in the cases of mental health, and uh, uh, I don't know if a lot of people, but some people have definitely become vocal about you know the problems that they are suffering uh, at work, in family, you know, in your neighborhood, and uh, a, a lot of people have got mental health issues because they've lost jobs. A lot of people are not able to do their jobs because they have mental health issues. So, uh, I mean, I would want to cut my intro short. We all know uh, what the problem is and let us focus more on uh, solutions that you all can uh, offer us. So if I can, I would want to start with uh, Dr. Jokshi 
uh, because you know Masina Hospital has been doing so much uh, around mental health even before uh, uh, we all started uh, talking about it. And uh, if you can uh, tell us, uh, you know, how the problem has increased in last one year, one and a half year post COVID, and uh, also how has it changed in the sense that you know, if you have, if you, if you're seeing a trend which did not exist before, you know, if, if there are younger people coming to you, if there are older people coming, what is or, or is it is it related to only uh, a particular age group? All the, all the if you can just run us through you know all the interesting uh, new details that you have been noticing in the last one and a half years. You are on mute, sir. You need to unmute. Heading an institution which has run a mental health facility for almost twenty five years, which is not. Uh, common because, you know, mental health uh, indoor facilities in most hospitals are not existing. And we've always had uh, a spectrum of uh, cases which uh, range from very mild to very severe psychosis. And uh, in this period, when there were, there were two challenges, you know, one is to continue the indoor admissions were, uh, were restricted because of the fact that we were afraid of COVID spreading. Because you know, even if you have mental health people staying together to make to ensure social distancing and COVID protocols in the indoor facility was a problem. So therefore, there were a lot of patients who could not seek the help that they required at that time, and they were actually uh, uh, you know suffering at home. And at that time, we we immediately thought of you know going on to the digital platform and going digital in a bigger way than what we were doing conventionally. So uh, you see, the even the, even a digital platform is difficult for people with mental illness. So it's not very easy. However, we made sure that we kept the services running, and we tried to you know uh, defer admission for as long as possible. But it was very difficult. And once the lockdown started, once the disease and the, uh, we, were, we, we were able to understand more about COVID and the fear of COVID became lesser, we started, you know, gradually taking patients in more and more into the single rooms and, the, uh, and uh, with a lot of care. So and sorry to interrupt you, but what are the kind of cases that you've been noticing more in no, the it, it, it's, it's the It's the same. In fact, the severity is more. There's no... I mean, I would not say there's any change in the kind of cases that you're getting. It's that we are, we are we were getting people who would be easily manageable at home because of with medication and all. But now, with the situation being worse, they the the severity and the number of cases started increasing a lot. That's and if you if if you have to give me a percentage, a rough idea of you know of both say around thirty to forty percent. Uh, around 30 percent 30 to 40 percent you can see. this is in the number of patients or uh, number both, of both the patients. severity and the number of patients i mean you would say that it was, it's a one third more than what would normally be there so i also ask this because you know i myself know uh, a patient as young as a 10 year old 11 year old you know who, who uh, was uh, who went into who was diagnosed with clinical depression after uh, covid then of course there are older people, there are younger people who have lost their jobs. Bhavna, if I can get you also in uh, Bhavna Gautam, not the MC. If I can get you in the <laughs> debate, uh, what uh, uh, what are the trends that you have been noticing, and you know uh, how do you? What are these kind of solutions that you have been offering? So uh, the way Dr. Vispi mentioned, I'm sure the the whole bulk of clinical and severe cases, uh, you know, are the ones that approach uh, an institution like Masina Hospital. What I noticed in my in my practice uh, was that during the first lockdown, Nazia, there was a larger number of people uh, probably coming in with anxiety. You know, because uh, there was this financial uncertainty, there was an uncertainty about how we are going to cope with the lockdown. There was no idea about how we are going to move across. However, with the second lockdown, there's just been a very, uh, I wouldn't call it significant, but of course, there's been a shift where I'm getting a lot of younger ones who are coming in typically in the age group of 18 to 25 roughly around 32 and now the idea or, or the major challenge that they are having is not uh, you know anxiety or depression it is this sense of hopelessness or helplessness because they were in an age group where they were looking forward to probably creating their uh, careers and starting a new journey altogether and in fact very interestingly one of the journals even reported this emotion and called it languishing 
so i actually saw this shift from uh, you know a lot of anxiety and depression to that languishing where people didn't know why they are doing and what they are doing and where they are headed and uh, in fact for them uh, you know to ignite hope when you yourself don't know how long the situation is going to last uh, was was quite uh, was quite a journey actually so you may tell them a lot of things as as mental health expert and especially as a holistic health expert i incorporate uh, you know many dimensions of health so whether it's your nutrition whether it's your fitness whether it's your meditation all of these aspects come into it but with the with the restrictions and what do you do there are people who are locked up in isolation and now they they are not allowed of their building they are not allowed of their uh, you know cubes we in, in mumbai we live in we, we literally live in you know tiny nests out here we do not even have space to go breathe how do you tell them that uh, okay you need to exercise and you need to ensure that you fix your diet and at the same time please stay connected with your family and stay connected with your friends because social how media are you addressing it? how am i addressing it yes so like i said it's 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 been a very uh, it's it's been quite a learning for me too we try to do uh, you know with a with a lot of history taking we try and understand what outlets can work for this particular uh, counseling it it cannot be a generalized approach it needs to be so customized and uh, it needs to really understand their fears and and move around that some of those fears may just be uh, you know just just be fears i mean that there, there's no basis to it but uh, you move you move with that but all of for me the main work still remains that it has to take into consideration all of these aspects their nutrition their fitness their social connect very importantly so uh, like i said holistic health in fact came into a much bigger role uh, rather than that piecemeal approach that was being implemented earlier dr murdia i mean uh, uh, because you are an ivf expert and you uh, deal with a lot of pregnant women you know postpartum depression has always been uh, you know something uh, uh, that a lot of women uh, go through i have myself had two pregnancies the pregnancy in itself is you know such a, a difficult journey for women now when you add covid stress to it huh? i mean what what kind of outcomes i mean what kind of patients are you handling and you know and uh, you you suffer from so many health issues when you're pregnant and with with a pandemic around you what is the mental state of women you know who are who were pregnant in last one year and uh, how do you help them how do you answer them so i think the biggest problem with this covid was that it suddenly hit uh, the world and there were um, people didn't know how to react people didn't know uh, what it can cause uh, what it can do and how to safeguard yourself uh, there have been a lot of uh, 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 uh misleading things happening uh you know digitally as well as through other medias uh, where people were really confused uh, as to what should be their step we have been having uh, patients who wanted to go for ivf but uh they were they were really scared in terms of uh, because of the fear of uh, pregnancy and there were few misconceptions that can a pregnant women go for a covid vaccination Uh, which which still uh, just got recently cleared off that they can uh, so till now there was uh, there was very un- uncertain situation that should i go for a covid vaccination and then go for a pregnancy or if i am pregnant how should i safeguard myself uh, can i go for a vaccination or not which is i think now clear so uh, you know it was very uh, typical for these patients and and we had put in a lot of efforts especially with the with the help of uh, telemedicine uh, teleconsultation uh, we have provided them with the helpline so they can get in touch with our doctors and they don't have to visit uh, you know hospitals unnecessary to expose them to such kind of conditions um, we have tried to provide them with uh, you know authentic information because there have been so much information floating from all around they really didn't know what to do and what not to do Uh, we have tried to advise them to you know isolate themselves with other people uh, be away from people as much as possible to safeguard their pregnancy and to shield themselves so i think But in, in terms also of also not very depressing you know to to be all alone when you're pregnant it, and so how do you address is. the mental health aspect of it you know? yeah it, it it is very depressing right and and at at times you can't do anything you you if if you are pregnant that is the only option that you have right there is no other option uh, the the only thing is uh, use digital technology to be in touch with uh, you know your relatives your people 
try to avoid uh, you know physical contacts uh, and coming close to people it is just like you know there there have been uh, you know uh, 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 deliveries being happening just imagine the kind of situation after that you have a baby with you and then you can't let people um you know uh, be around you or help you out right because it's very scary you don't want to expose your babies to such kind of situation so it has been really bad but i think uh, somehow the way digital has helped uh, you know people uh, connect to their doctors and this telemedicine uh, thing floating around it has really helped i think a lot of patients to uh, get the right answers by connecting to the right doctors uh, shamanta samantha or shamanta because uh... you have written shamanta it's shamanta yeah shamanta shamanta okay so shamanta if i can have you uh, in the uh, discussion so you know i was wondering uh, i forgot my question that's so from you i wanted to yeah. ask you know uh, let me go through my so basically if you you first tell me what are the kind of patients you are getting right now and uh, what are the solutions you are giving to them so uh, i work since i work in a hospital setting i usually see um, post uh, op and pre op right and also uh, am i audible yes but yeah. if you can be a little louder hello hi hello I think we've lost. Uh, if I can, I, I remember the question. If I can come back to Mr. Jokchi, uh, you know the biggest problem with mental health right, has always been uh, first there is a stigma attached to it. Secondly, it is very difficult to you know tell the person suffering from mental health issues. You know to tell the person that you need some kind of help. You should go and see a doctor. People get offended. They're already going through a lot of uh, turmoil within themselves. How do you? handle these kind of situations you know how do you go and tell a person in your family or in your neighborhood or at work that you know you need help see basically uh, you are you are asking this question to the wrong person because i am not a mental health professional i mean i, so I actually had wanted to ask such a matter but there was but i still but i still yeah, ask I'll ask an answer your question see there is a stigma to mental health no doubt about it but the fact that the acceptance that that mental health is an issue today has become easier especially since the time uh, people have started coming out in the open of course covid has helped to some extent but more than that in the recent past uh, you know celebrities talking about depression celebrities talking about anxiety has helped to my mind uh, one of the things which we want to introduce as a hospital is that even in any any executive health checkup in the hospital you would never get an executive health checkup which checks your mental health and i am very keen that uh, in fact I had, I had plans to introduce that in my executive health checkup in my hospital right from the beginning unfortunately with covid all the executive health checkups also have closed down you don't do executive health checkups at all so a simple questionnaire uh, dash score or something you know which will just give a simple idea whether someone needs uh, some screening tool is required to you know make people aware that well you i mean you don't have to be actually having overt or covert symptoms of mental dis disorders sometimes they are so subtle that you 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 will pick it up early and then maybe you know that's the time to intervene and make sure that you don't land up in a bad situation so i think that's what i would put it as my shamanta the, the question i wanted to ask you then was that uh, how if i notice you know if i feel that there is somebody uh, in my family or might some of my colleague you know or my in my neighborhood who is who has become little aggressive or you know who's uh, who's become a loner who's not talking the way he used to how are, what is the right way to approach the person and you know tell the person that you know i think you need help or you need to go and see because you, people get very offended the minute you try to tell them that you know you could have mental health issues they come back and say you have mental health issues you have lost it you know so how how do you handle that absolutely and also sorry what are the first, some signs that we should notice you know what are the first few uh, signs that are very important to you know observe which give you that idea that this person might be suffering from a mental health from something to do with mental health um okay so answering your second question first so we need to look out for the signs and symptoms right so any any mental health you need to um, be louder 
uh, any me so uh, answering your second question first um, we need to look out for the signs and symptoms right so any mental health um, uh, disorder or symptom for that matter will have um, certain symptoms like it it can have physiological symptoms it can have um, emotional symptoms it can have uh, physical symptoms right so uh, when first uh, we need to understand um, what are these symptoms and um, what are these signs and what are they related to right so if it's like anxiety for that matter right so we they will be showing um, um, uh, bodily cues they will have some sort of uh, reaction to a particular situation so we need to understand then we will be able to tell that okay yes this person is having an issue right but um, and again uh, if it's depression for that matter they will try and avoid social um, situations or they might isolate themselves or they might have excess crying disturb sleep and appetite right so um, so each problem has a different set of signs and symptoms so depending on that uh, we will be able to identify that right and um, wh what was the first question again first question is that how do you tell the approach person? what them, is right? the right approach uh, way to them. approach the person and uh, convince the person to uh, go and see somebody like you or bhavna right um i think uh, first understanding who is very close to that person i think uh, like any random person just cannot go and like talk to them and say you need help right so, because they might get offended even though they would need help um saying the way you say it also matters right how you say it where you say it uh, matters a lot you can't say it in public you can't say it in a way that uh, could be disrespectful or offensive to that person right so uh, you need to understand okay uh, this is a sensitive matter right and uh, maybe i have to be close enough to that person to be able to uh, um, have a discussion around this topic right and once i do that uh, and also um, if you cannot approach that person directly like um, you know have this conversation with them directly then maybe uh, giving them an example right or you know like talking in terms of a third person and helping them realize that okay you know uh, you like you too can take help right like since somebody else uh, took help and felt better or or you know um put themselves in a better situation because of taking help and there is no stigma or shame surrounded around taking uh, uh, help right because the mental health and stigma just like come hand in hand so i think uh, um reducing that stigma and uh, normalizing the fact that you can take help whether it's um, whether you have to take medication or just go to therapy um and also helping them understand that people who just want to talk about their week also go to mental health professionals and it's just not just people who have uh, severe mental health uh, issues so informing people about this educating people will really help uh, i i want to come back come to you kali i just want uh, bhavna to add uh, very briefly to it you know how how do you suggest uh, one should approach uh, somebody who's suffering from mental health so uh, nazi i get a lot of parents who ask how do i get my child into therapy or a lot of spouses who say how do i get my uh, partner to you know be part of this therapy process and i Even always parents, tell them, you know if yeah yeah like children saying can i get my mother to to therapy and it isn't easy for a child to do that and i always tell them uh, irrespective of whether the person comes or doesn't come the first thing you need to do is be a genuine listener you know i have realized that most of the times people want help they just don't ask for it because like i said it's a stigma or or their egos get in the way or they feel that they are going to be judged but every time um, the supporting people around have been good listeners and they actually go with the idea of uh, you know suggesting things rather than implying that okay you need help people have been more open to seeking therapy so i usually in fact land up training uh, the people who come to me for somebody else i train them on how to become a better listener and maybe the other person would feel much more uh, at ease saying okay you know what i think i'll take your suggestion piali uh, you 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 told us that you know you have uh, suffered uh, from anxiety and despite uh, suffering from anxiety or uh, your, your own issues you have done remarkably well uh, in your career you uh, won awards as a uh, 
marketing and communication expert so uh, i would really want you to take us through your story and also tell us what are the kind of uh, uh, support an employee would need you know from your uh, office or you know your and how do you uh, speak to them and what where are the loopholes and what can be done to improve it also Nazia, thanks for the question. Um, so I've been, uh, you know, um, a mental illness um, survivor, I like to call myself because I've suffered uh, for over 23 years, I continue to live with clinical depression and anxiety. So it's not just anxiety. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just think that, um, you know, mental health is a spectrum, right? It's, it's, on one end of it, you have people like me who are severely ill. And on the other hand, end of it, you have people who are perhaps going through some kind of a phase, um, you know, are starting to probably show some kind of symptoms and they would want uh, to just talk about it. Uh, like Bhavna also was saying, you know, the importance of listening, right? Um, I think specifically talking about the kind of support system that you need um, at work, I just feel, um, and without, you know, mincing words, I'd like to say that I think India is far behind. Um, I think that um, most uh, organizations, and I'm talking about very large organizations, I won't be unfortunately taking names here, but I've worked with very, very large organizations where my personal experience has been that, you know, people have very, very low to nil awareness about how do you deal with people with mental illness. And it's challenging because it's, um, it's a dual battle then for people like us, because you're fighting a battle with your own mind where there are voices in your head that you can't necessarily control. And there are voices that are going on telling you that you're gonna fail, you know, your life is not worth living, you're not good enough, you're good for nothing, everything is wrong, everything is going wrong. Um, so that's a, that's an internal battle that you fight. And then externally, you fight a battle with the ecosystem that you're within, uh, which kind of identifies you as somebody that's a little different, a little off, somebody that is a loner, is not a people's person, which is typically not looked at as a good sign in, in a corporate setup, is not, um, you know, uh, is not a team player, you know, these are the words that, you know, this is the sort of typical feedback that is kind of given to people uh, that isolate themselves and not realizing that that's actually, um, you know, a symptom of a, a disease that the person kind of lives with, right? And it all stems from tremendous amount of apathy. I think the correct word is apathy because it's not just about uh, not knowing, it's about not wanting to know because it's not their reality, right? Um, it's it's almost, and I'm sure that, you know, things have changed quite a bit in the last year and a half with COVID. Uh, doctor mentioned that, you know, he's seen a 30 to 40% rise in cases, and obviously that has led to greater awareness. And while COVID has taken away a lot, I think the one thing that it's given is higher awareness around mental illness and mental health in general. But I think that, you know, uh, even today, uh, I think organizations have no structured way of dealing with people with mental illness. There is no policy in place. I mean, last year when Zomato declared, a, a, you know, a period leaves, right? There was so much of um, uh, chatter around it, right? Um, but when would we actually see mental health leaves, right? I mean, when, when can an employee very safely write a letter to a, a manager? And I'm, very, I'm, I'm actually currently very fortunate to be a part of an organization where I have leadership, which is extremely empathetic, uh, but that's, never, that, that's not really been the case all my 15 years that I've been uh, you know, in the business, right? Uh, I, I, because you know, when, you're going, when you're feeling the way you, you feel when you're mentally ill, uh, you are constantly under uh, this continuous worry that, you know, if I talk about uh, the fact that I'm, I'm mentally not okay, uh, my performance and the way I am in the organization will be looked at through the prism of, oh, she's mentally ill. 
and therefore she's a burden or oh you know i mean she's problematic or things that's the usual narrative right so the the point is that you know a like i said there is no structured way of dealing with people there is lack of awareness there is apathy there is a um, tremendous amount of um uh, you know um neglect right uh, because you know um i've how had did you uh, how did if you can give an example of how did you handle on day to day basis you know uh, having a corporate job and having this illness uh, how did you tackle the issue i mean you know you tackle it because there's no other way it's like you know it's like asking i mean what's the what's the alternative do you just quit and do you just kind of give up on everything in life you can't because you know you have um you have to so how do you survive uh, it's it's very tough nazia it's extremely tough to survive because yeah, but what, uh, but i would want you to uh, tell us uh, you know in a way that it, survival uh, mechanism so the mechanism. people who are listening would know that there is a way to survive because you have survived well right? i think that the the way to survive is to continue to do what you're doing and focusing on um the things that you're good at and to uh, to ensure that you know you are able to um you know you're able to distance the disease from the person right um uh, you know the disease is a part of us but it is not um it is not entirely who we are there are other aspects to us so for example i am mentally ill but i could also be somebody that's uh, good at painting or um you know is 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 a good friend a good listener um you know uh, fun to hang out with uh, uh, amongst people that i genuinely like not necessarily a lot of people but you know people that i genuinely like um i'm somebody that could be very well read for example so there are other aspects to me that also make up who i am also right? as a professional you might be having some bad days but on most other days you are doing your job pretty well so um here here's here's the thing about it right there are days and there are many days uh that you don't even feel like getting off the bed that's a reality right uh, uh and again it dif differs from person to person not everybody's case is as severe as me or as chronic as mine but there are many days when you don't feel like even getting off the bed forget attending meetings but the way i have been able to cope with it to, is to just constantly tell myself that you've just got to do this you've just got to do this and you cannot let the disease become bigger than you right and have you uh, taken you, help of professional counselors of and of course of course i mean if you've lived with the disease for over half your life uh, you've 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 reached out to every possible doctor and psychologist and psychiatrist and taken all kinds of help that there is out there and the best of help but in certain cases um you know uh, there's something called treatment resistant dep depression uh, which is trd uh, and i don't want to get too technical but i'm sure you know there are doctors on this panel so i'm sure they would know what i'm talking about um my case is that unfortunately so it is kind of treatment resistant uh, i still haven't given up hope and i continue to take my medicines um you know uh, but uh, but you know like i said not everybody's case is as severe there are cases that are less severe and they are able to manage better i am able to manage the way i am because i've lived with it for so long so for me now i have been able to you ask me how do you cope one of the ways of coping is to be able to identify your triggers is to be able to list down um you know uh what are the things that could be potential triggers or have been triggers in the past and how do you kind of build a shield around yourself to try and see if you can protect yourself from those triggers and it's not going to happen all the time you're not going to be able to protect yourself every time from those triggers there would be days when you would be triggered by something something not working out or you know something frustrating you deeply but the idea is to uh try and constantly kind of build that wall wall around yourself to that's my personal mechanism it, it it differs from person to person i'm just telling you what works for me and it is it, it is the ability to to identify triggers right um so i think going back to you know corporate policies i think that one of the things that i strongly feel about is you know when we talk about diversity and inclusion at work 
you know, diversity and inclusion is not just about hiring 50% uh, women, right? That is one kind of diversity. And I'm, I'm you know, me being a woman and being a, um, you know, very proud feminist, I think that I'm all for diversity in the boardroom, all for breaking the glass ceiling and having more women. But diversity and inclusion is also about ensuring that you have enough, uh, you know, people of different backgrounds and different worldviews, right? People with mental illness have a very different worldview, which in many cases could actually be an asset to the company, which most, most companies don't realize. For example, when you live with anxiety, you're, you, you, you're kind of always, you know, you're always preempting what can go wrong, right? You, you can become risk averse, but you're always kind of sniffing out problems. Um, before anybody else can, because you look at everything as, as a risk factor, right? You look at everything as a potential source of risk. Now that in many ways could actually be a positive thing in a team because everybody else might be like, oh, you know, we're going to be very gung-ho about something. And then you need that one person to say that, hey, but listen, have we thought about this and this could actually backfire, right? So having neurodiverse people um, in the organization and actually, you know, uh, making that effort to, uh, you know, go out and look for people that live with, uh, you know, neurodiversity of some sort. Uh, and again, neurodiversity is massive, but, you know, I think, I think is, is one of the things that organizations should very, very actively doing, uh, be doing, just as they should be actively hiring LGBTIQ uh, people, for example. Right. Uh, similarly, I think there should be representation of people that are mentally ill, because when you see somebody who's mentally ill, who's successful, who is in the senior leadership, it gives you tremendous confidence and tremendous um, impetus to go on and tell yourself that, listen, if she could or if he could, I can too. And I'm going to do this. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, uh, because of technical glitches, we uh, started late and now we are already out of time. Uh, Mr. Jadil has already joined for the next panel. So, uh, you know, now I want to uh, discuss that last uh, final uh, thing, which uh, which I hope we, we, we can discuss for next 10 minutes at least. How do we make, uh, you know, uh, like, there was this incident of Deepika Padukone coming out and you know talking about mental health issues. Then there was Arya Bhatt's sister who started talking about her mental health issues. Uh, how do how can we uh, as as a nation, as people, you know, how can celebs and how can uh, brands embrace this and you know uh, make it uh, make it perfectly fine to you know have uh, mental health issues and bring in more awareness about it? So I can. Uh, I can start with Mr. Uh, Dr. Murdia, you know, if you can, uh, if you would want to uh, talk about it, because I also remember Isha, they sure. talk about postpartum depression, you know, how she suffered and from it and she overcame it. So uh, what can celebs and brands and corporates do about uh, this whole issue of mental health? I think uh, India really lacks, uh, you know, the awareness about it. And you know, what uh, Piali uh, has described, uh, you know, for me, it's very difficult to even understand, right? Because someone who has suffered really knows what he or she has been through. The person on the other side doesn't realize what they have done, right? Uh, we have had a long uh, array of discussions with LGBT uh, uh, people. And, you know, finally, India has achieved that level where uh, now we recognize uh, that they also, you know, are a part of this society. Um, I think uh, uh, there has to be uh, something which is lead from example. The organization have to take it as a priority and channelize it. It is not just having a policy around and, and just saying that we have something like this in place. It is about, you know, you have to lead by example. You have to share uh, let's say uh, for this, uh, you know, COVID crisis, the managers need to talk about their mental, uh, you know, wellness issues to employees under them. Then only you can uh, initiate a discussion. There has to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, effort being made from the media side. There has to be effort uh, made from the celebrity side. I, I still remember a movie, Tare Zamipa, right, which had a bit of flavor about uh, the same issue. So that created a lot of ripples that, you know, something like this exists. Otherwise, people don't know and people don't understand that something like this exists. As psychologists, yes, you guys uh, definitely get cases which are, you know, of these uh, uh, nature and you know and you understand that something like this can happen. But for a normal public, 
for normal organizations for normal people they are unaware of all this thing they they really don't understand that you know someone can go through this and what what is the kind of struggle that they have this is something that we need to bring out as a society we need to accept it as how we have accepted other things in india and i think uh, there is so much work to be done on this because uh, covid has really shown us that uh, you know this thing has become a highlight now uh, people are suffering from it and at the end of the day uh, it is the organization that will be uh, suffering if the employees of the organization are having mental health issues and there have been a studies conducted in the western world which says that every 1 dollar that you invest on the mental health you will have additional 2 to 4 dollars of revenue being generated for the organization so i think it it is something that we really need to work on now i think we need to i i and take that quote from you later and circulate it to as many corporates as we can so uh, chamanta you have to uh, sum it up uh, for me in 2 minutes because i we really need to wrap up yeah sure i completely agree with dr mordia um but Mind. adding to that uh, i completely uh, agree with dr mordia but add, uh, adding to that i would like to say that um, you know create safe spaces for people to converse about uh, mental health you know whether it's creating uh, social support groups right um, it could be formal or informal and uh, also um, having regular conversations about mental health uh, uh, in the workplace setting right even at homes uh, i get a lot of cases where um, people tell me that they cannot um, discuss about mental health at home because it's it's not even acknowledged right so when they say that i am going through so and so uh, family members just brush it off and say you know what it's just you know um, you're just pretending or or maybe like you know uh, this is just a phase get over it and things like that so uh, having that conversation is so so important right bhavna uh nazia taking from what uh, piali just uh, addressed so beautifully i believe the the one way where we can create that huge impact which is required you know vis-a-vis uh, -vis the slow growth that we are seeing on the awareness and accessibility is to create a more community based approach people need to rethink their relationship in communities and there are so many communities that need to come together to create an entire ecosystem talk about uh, mental health in schools talk about mental health among pregnant women talk about mental health among the chronically ill in the hospitals talk about mental health of the caregivers so unless each community and each ecosystem does as its bit in getting the awareness done i think that complete chain and link chain doesn't get created so whether we are talking about conventional medicine and and doctors out there who treat you for maybe physical ailments what stops them from bringing in this element of you know what if you're feeling too uh, too disconnected with your physical health situation why don't you also approach a therapist why don't you also go to a counselor why don't you also see a psychiatrist it needs to get normalized on multiple levels so that people know that they are in an ecosystem and not an isolated hunt to find support for their mental health so i believe we need to interlink these community efforts together Doctor Joshi, sir, you are on mute. Sir, you need. Yeah. So basically, the of course everybody has spoken about this aspect of you know widespread awareness, and actually, in at, to some extent in Masina Hospital, the fact that we have a mental health unit for a long time, uh, it is. it's like almost natural for many of our patients to sort of seek mental health uh, help so it is not that bad in that in 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 our sit in our hospital as such but in society my question was yeah how to how to create awareness and what can we as yes, a society and yes, particularly so corporate you know office no, no. officers can do for their employees to improve uh, yes i can that is exactly what i am saying that that the, to mainstream this mental health issue is therefore i i spoke in the beginning to you know pick up make it a part of a mental health, a part of a physical and a mental health checkup as i said an executive health checkup should have mental component itself besides that the uh, question of uh, see basically everybody is afraid of mental health illnesses because person who was not only does it put you back it affects your own livelihood it affects the livelihood of the caregivers who are around you because they they don't know what to do with you you become unproductive 
And the last and most important thing is when you have a mental health illness, it becomes a very costly and a socio-economically dis uh, destroying affair for you. I mean, it's completely, you know, it, it puts the whole family's uh, socio-economic status haywire. So, I mean, there is a finiteness to a physical illness, which is not there in a mental illness. A mental illness is a prolonged illness. It's something which is a fear of the unknown. And even if you become aware and you want to seek help, you are afraid of, you know, going ahead and, and, and actually seeking help. So there are many dimensions to this. The awareness, of course, is the first factor. But today in our, in our country, it has to get coupled with the cost of treatment also. Because ultimately, today, uh, although the Mental Health Act mandates that insurance is supposed to be given, but is this the ground reality? That's a question I always ask them. But on the ground, you do not get insurance for mental health illnesses because there are still not prop no proper guidelines for that. I mean, in, a, in any ins in conventional insurance, you have to declare a pre-existing disease. Here, how do you define pre-existing disease? How do you define a, an attempt at suicide, whether suicide is supposed to be given a status of a mental illness or whether it has to be treated and what, what is the cost of treatment? So there are many other aspects to this besides just the awareness. So that I, I'm sorry I have digressed a bit, when, but I touched on a third topic because I feel that so it's all linked. So that's absolutely necessary. You need to cover mental illness in under insurance. Otherwise, a lot of people would uh, would it not go. Not. I mean, I, I know somebody who was seeking, uh, going to a counselor, but the counselor would uh, charge 3,000 or 4,000 per hour. That was adding to the mental illness, you know, that was not reducing it. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, Piali, if you can conclude the session uh, for us. Well, I think that three things. One is uh, first, uh, recognize that mental illness is an illness, right? I think that awareness has to be built uh, to, to raise enough awareness through conversations, uh, to involve stakeholders, for example, the press. Uh, like communities, for example, like Dr. Bhavna uh, said, and to uh, to acknowledge that mental illness is an illness is not something that is in your mind, right? The second thing I think is, uh, uh, you know, to be able to, um, you know, actively um, encourage conversations in corporate setups uh, where, uh, you know, uh, people can come out and share their stories, uh, which gives other people the courage to do that and helps destigmatize it, helps uh, demystify it. Like uh, Dr. Joki also said that, you know, this is the this is a fear of the unknown. And uh, that's the only way to kind of do that. And the third, obviously, is to have, uh, you know, taste makers, influencers, uh, people in the, in, 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 in the know, uh, people in the limelight, like, for example, Deepika, people of influence, who would be able to come out and share their stories, because that also gives tremendous amount of, um, you know, courage uh, for people like me uh, to, to come out and talk about uh, what it is like to actually live with an illness like this. So I think, you know, that's how I would sum up, sum it up. Three, three key things. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, I've been getting messages for the last five minutes to conclude it. Although I would have loved to have this conversation going on for another half an hour or so. I mean, this was really enriching. Uh, thanks again. And you guys are really doing a great job because, you know, mental illness is, has become a, a big problem for our country. I was reading a report that w of WHO that India, I think, is the most depressed country right now. Uh, I don't know if it's this is most post after uh, China. Okay. So I think it's related to population, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks again. And uh, we're very sorry that we started late because of technical problems and we had to uh, finish it uh, more or less on time. Thanks a lot. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank it you. was a pleasure thank talking you so to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nazia. you did a fine Bye. job. Thank too. you, Nazia. Thank you. Nazia did a fine job too. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Okay, bye-bye.